everybody, we're just going to take a minute to get the Facebook live up. Um, so just hold on and uh, maybe let a few more people in. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second module of our Handball Development Symposium. Excited to see everyone back and rejoining us. This second module is entitled Developing Technical Skills and will run for the next three hours. So I will pass it off to Craig Grote, who is our first lecturer. And his first presentation is entitled The Development Process as a player. So take it away, Craig. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back. I hope you all enjoyed your uh, one hour break. I appreciate everyone uh, who's committed to uh, staying on and uh, learning uh, some very important um, things. Uh, the first module, which was on the identification of technical skills, was a a foundation for the symposium in that we can now move on and talk about uh, the real uh, process of what it means to develop a player. And if you remember, we were talking that this, that we're, we're speaking completely from a uh, developing world uh, mindset, meaning we're not looking at Europe as our model, although we may look at some of their videos uh, for uh, answers to technical issues, we are working on what it means to develop in the United States and North America and by extension into Central and South America as well, since so many of our friends and colleagues uh, were intertwined with us in the Pan American Federation for so many years. So I'm going to um, get to work right now discussing uh, with you uh, what it means to uh, be uh, a person and uh, a handball player and what it means to be uh, have the, uh, the development process focused on you. Tomorrow, we will talk at the same scheduled time in the afternoon about the development process for teams. But right now, we're looking at individuals. And I, I need a note here that when I speak in terms right now, I'm speaking in generalized I ideal oh. terms and not with uh, the idea that we will have uh, uh, arguments or disagreements about uh, the different types of players. We're gonna try to speak as broadly as we can to convey topics that are necessary for lectures five and six, when we really get into the weeds on what it means to, or how to develop. Right now, I'm gonna tell you uh, uh, what we develop and what the processes are. So we're gonna come back to our uh, pyramid, the development pyramid. And this time I wanna talk about it in, in, in more commanding terms. Um, like we talked about before, tomorrow we look down from gameplay, analyzing the game and then how we make the other parts affect the game. Uh, now we're gonna look at it from the individual and at that baseline, look at that base layer. There's five characteristic areas to develop within a player. The first on the far right, completely contextual and absent of technique is game understanding, which means I understand the game problems I'm presented with and I can do what I'm asked on the court. Um, we use game problems in PE and in developing children's handball because it's so effective of a learning tool and meets the needs of standardized education. Um, we're speaking today more from a coaching and development uh, idea so uh, for clubs and after school programs, more so than uh, for a PE class. So game understanding is, is intimately intertwined and affects everything on that individual level. Um, as we move from right to left, we move to tactical skills. Tactical skills, this is important. This is the most important distinction I can make right now. Tactical skills on the individual level, which means that we're, they're taking and applying the technical skills they learned in isolation over on the other side, and they come over to the right, and now they're applying them in game-like, like game context situations. 
So the, the, the idea here is that the uh, court orientation matters in this because of the visual cueing and different things. And so it matters that you understand the difference between what's a tactical skill and a technical skill, although techniques are used for both. On the other side of the physical psychological is the technical. And the technical for me is, is really in isolation from the game context, meaning uh, you'll see drills later that show how kids can develop skills in joint collaboration or working on individualized stuff. And then they look at that individualized stuff and the rudimentary actions are at the base of that. But the core, the core of everything we're discussing today, the rest of today is in that main hub, the physical and psychological. Um, it's, it's important to understand that, that this is the base of the player, the individual. That represents the individual. And he's a, a, he or she is reflective of all the other pieces around. And so we're gonna move forward now to talk about the four primary domains of athlete development. Now, these are important to understand because the, there's, there's four areas in which you as a player or you as a coach can, can, can really affect how your players develop. The first is technical which we've, we've gone over. And by technical, I mean, I, can I do the skills needed of me on the court? The second is tactical, meaning can I use those skills effectively to make solve problems on the court? The third is physical. Now I want you to think of physical as a coordination and conditioning aspect. We are going to have a gentleman from the USOPC talking about that topic in the breakout room following mine, which is a great uh, uh, continuation of these ideas and a good bedrock, just like the conditioning and coordination is in for athletic development, it's a good bedrock for what I'll follow with lectures five and six. And the last is psychological. Now psychological covers a lot of areas which I'll get into, but I just want you to conceptualize it right now because as we move to the back to the, the, the uh, development pyramid, you can see now the four areas are the foundation for handball development. And so right here is the core. And from this, we build athletes uh, into players. And so like, I really want us to consider and look at this graphic because I'm gonna do many things to it over the next three lectures because it's very important, but it's all interrelated. And so we have to begin with the psychological and the physical and adapt to it in the needs for technical and tactical. And so as we see this, we go to the training pyramid. Now, these are the most important things that I can tell you because the first lectures were about what? This is about how. Each of these correspond to the development pyramid, but they are practice tasks. As a coach, as a teacher, as a player, consider these buckets, the buckets that you have to fill to, to improve the gameplay that you have. And so if you start from the game understanding, you look and now you have game problems. You have to understand what are the game problems. We teach kids four basic game problems. Moving the ball up the court, maintaining possession, attacking the goal and scoring, and regaining ball possession. Everything is in that object of the game and context that we teach children. Okay, and so in that far right corner, you're looking at something that is very important that you're teaching or imparting or learning if you're a player. As you go to the far left, devoid of context is the rudiments. Those are the, we talked about them before, those are the transferring energy from your left to right, the uh, wrist, wrist uh, flexibility, different things like that, all built into technical skills. They're just actions, okay? And then you look out and remember where our core four uh, graphic was. Now you look at that core four, you have conditioning drills and problem solving. Now, this is an important thing to consider. That central one has two factors, psychological and physical. The physical goes with one group, the psychological goes with the other, but they're all interrelated. And you have to start thinking about it as we consider development of players. And now, it, and this goes for all players. This goes for young players. This goes for uh, old players. This goes for non-athletic players who are looking for recreational. This is how you build uh, proficiency in playing a sport. And so I really want us to consider this. The first thing we have to do, oops, going the wrong way. The first thing we have to do is break off the technical training pyramid and think of it as its own thing. 
The technical training pyramid has its own hierarchy, completely separated from context. If you look now, context and, and tactics are gone. Game forms, tactical games, small-sided games, tactical drills, and game problems have been removed. Now we're looking at the actions that our players can do. These are the tools. Let's consider this the tools, the tools that they need, whether it's in the game context or not, this is how we, we build them. And so with the, the, the first concept, the first domain is developing players for technical proficiency. It's important. It's, it, it's, you, you need the tools before you can go. It's like, do you teach offense first or defense first? If Julio had more time, I was going to ask him that question, which, when he has a pre-competition camp, which group do you look for first to form? I know for him, it's defense. It's the first thought on his mind. Everybody thinks that, but he's confident that they're coming in with, with offensive skills. When you have fresh new players just walked out of the, out, out of the uh, outside into the gym, you have to start with technical before you can go to tactical. They need some tools that they can do. You can incorporate game problems and different things to encourage them when they're younger, but you're going to have to focus on technical. You're going to have to look at it. But when we get smart, as you'll see later, we, you'll get smart when we look later at how to creatively conjoin the two together so that you're, you're simultaneously meeting both needs. But I want us to separate it in our heads for right now. We have to think about the, this first domain. This first domain is important because of what's known as the OODA loop, okay? The OODA loop is very important. Observation, orientation, decision, action. In the game, all technical skills are required to perform. And if you look, observation, it, it, now you're talking about decision making. You're talking about problem solving. You have to see, know, choose, do. The technical training period or pyramid focuses on that, that last one on the do. Does not touch choose or the, pretty much doesn't and doesn't uh, touch know or see. Okay, it's not worried about that. It's worried about replication. And that's important to understand uh, if you're working on something and you evaluated a player who's requiring something that you focus on the do if there's a problem with the technical. If there's a problem with problem solving, that's for a tactical game or a tactical drill, not a technical drill. But for technical development, this is important to remember. When introducing skills, you must consider many things. Volume and quantity, performance and repetition. How often should they do it? How many times, how long during practice, how many times? Performance under stress, intensity and quality. Now this is, I firmly believe that you have to begin, you, you have to begin in one place and you have to end in more and more and more game-like condition. You introduce, and we're gonna go over this at the end, but you have to begin and expect quality of the performance and add stress and intensity and allow them to develop the skill under that. And you can do that just in the technical pyramid because you've chosen for them. You're not looking at, you're not looking at them choosing the drill or choosing a technique, you've chosen for them. And then you have density and frequency. And this is important, performance and time. It should replicate, your practice task should replicate the occurrence in a game. So if, if, if it's a situation that occurs once a game, and it is a maybe you shouldn't practice or train for it. If it, you need to look at what are the situations, the problems we're solving, what are the techniques needed, and how often do they see them? And you should try to replicate them in that sort of a. You shouldn't do. You shouldn't do uh, twenty uh, long crosses in a row. You should do two or three because that replicates it. Give them thirty seconds of rest and then have them come do it again. That replicates the game-like situation for them. And then you have to consider get coll collision and contact. Remember this, collision is your legs on the floor called vibrational load. Uh, the more intensity uh, and, and stress you place them under, the larger the collision load and contact, which means in contact with uh, other players. And that means performance in game-like conditions. So that's really what you have to focus on when introducing new skills, especially technical skills. You want to perform in repetition, perform under stress, perform in correct timing, and then have game-like conditions. The tactic, domain two, is different. Tactics are, are 
they, they need to be methodical. And so you have problem solving. So if you start at the lower left here, and we're gonna break these apart in the next lectures, but if you start in the lo lower left, you can incorporate problem solving into a player's training and development. You can have on-court tasks in which, I, I love doing it with kids. You give them a number pattern. I think we're gonna see something later today on that in one of the videos um, where they, they have to replicate that pattern. You're teaching them action coordinated with problem solving. You're taking, now you're teaching them game context. And then you start with, but you have to start with where they're at with the game problems. The first game problem they face is, is, is attacking open space, which I talked about in technique, why I teach kids the long jump shot first, because it's the technique they need most because it's the first game problem they face, selecting open space and attacking it. And then you have between when you have the problem solving and the game problem in place, now you have the tactical drill. The tactical drills should and always be uh, game oriented. Like I said before, you have to they have to start to visually recognize placement on the court and replicate it in their head as they're problem solving. If you do it outside, you can do it outside and so, or outside of that space, but it, with tactical drills, it's very important. And that's related to tactical, tactical games as well, which we'll get to. But tactical drills, as I'll show in lecture uh, six, are very important component in technical development, but they add that second layer of problem solving. And then on top, you have small sided games. And this is important to understand at the top of the tactical training pyramid for uh, developing players is the concept that there is games that are completely devoid of of handball properties. So it's we're going to discuss it more in the next lecture or uh, in two lectures, but we're small sided games really focus on uh, keep away. Like like and we're going to talk about in the beginning of lecture six how or lecture uh, lecture seven how the the object of the game of each phase micro phase can be games that you can place in small sided games very important uh, training tool for tactical but this is just an overview and if my my first one hadn't failed if my first uh, slideshow hadn't failed uh, because of uh, it got uh, corrupted you would have seen this graphic before uh, instead of the multi copies of the the court I showed and so I want to come back to this domain two training for tactical development. Remember, I talked about this in the beginning. You're an individual, you're a small group, and you're a team concept. It's action. What am I doing? Context. Who am I doing it with? System. What should we be doing? We're going to ask some hard questions in lecture seven about, uh, uh, about these sort of uh, 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 ideas, and I want us to consider that now. Think about the uh, if you're the right person in the wrong uh, context. Or the, or, or the wrong person in the right context. There's a lot of things you have to deal with with player development, which we'll discuss more tomorrow. But I really want you to focus now that we're doing simultaneously three things at once when we're players. The goal for all developing players is techno-tactical synergy. Now that seems like a, a big term, a big word, but it's not. All it means is, is that my technical and my tactical have come together and are one there's different periods of development in which this happens it doesn't mean you're a pro player it just means your your needs and your wants are met and i'll use a, a toddler analogy toddlers are their worst in two places they're the worst when their body can't do what their mind wants to do and they're and the opposite of it when their mind can't do what their body wants to do. And so when toddlers are off, it's when they have issues. And te techn uh, techno-tactical synergy is when those come together and they balance each other out. I'm playing the game I should be playing, whether it's a at a foundational level to go back to skills. If, I, if, if I'm in the, the level where I'm supposed to be at foundational, that's awesome. My, I can do what I know I'm supposed to do. I'm doing it autonomously. It doesn't mean I'm doing everything. It doesn't mean I do a high level of it, but I have synergy between the two. And that's really the goal of all player development. And if, you're a, if you are a player right now sitting here and you're in a situation where you can't, um, you can't find the right club, I'm going back to tell you, it's, you need to focus. You're going to be upset. And it, more, more players leave handball and sports because they don't get this met. 
This should be the goal for all coaches and this should be the goal for all players. You can, as a player, work on the bottom three of the foundation with apps completely absent of your coach. Rudimentary actions, physical and psychological and game understanding. You can improve that without them. The other areas you have to do in collaboration with your team. On the technical skills, you can, but there's only a point because technical skills in isolation are useless. And so I really want us to think and consider this idea of techno-tactical synergy as the place that we want to get. And what's interesting is when you're at techno-tactical synergy, your gameplay reflects it. And that's what's important. The end game of all coaches, as we'll learn tomorrow, is gameplay. And for you at home, it's important to understand that this has got to be the goal. You got to focus both on technical and you got to focus both on tactical, which means all these areas beneath it. There's seven there. You have to focus on those to go there. And then we, we get to training for development, physical development. The, the third domain, and, and, and the man from the USOPC is going to talk about it after this. This is a hugely important domain. This, is, this will dictate how far you go in the sport. When you will discuss, we'll discuss fatigue and different things and its effects on game planning at, in a later discussion. But for right now, you can control one thing as a player, and that's coordination and conditioning. You have an, you have a, it's not a limitless fount, but you can always get better. Even in decline, you can get better. And it doesn't affect game understanding, but it affects everything else. And it affects your tactical ability in the game because everybody knows when you lose your legs, you lose your mind. Once you get fatigued in handball, you can't play handball. It's just too hard. There's too much going on. Your body, is your body has turned over the thought process to survival, not to, not to uh, problem solving. And so your brain shuts down when you lose your legs. Everyone's different. Every player's different, but that's the way it is. Now I want to come back. So training for physical development. Now we're taking apart the tactical or the technical training pyramid. We're looking at this one piece individually, the conditioning drills. As a coach, this matters. Coordinate, because of space, I left it out, but this is coordination and conditioning. As a coach, you can work this in to game-like tasks. You can move this into rudimentary and technical actions, but it's important. And improvement here has improvement everywhere for player development. And it can't be something that you just show up at the gym and just play handball and go home and that's enough. Maybe that is, and that's, we'll talk about it also later, about if maybe that's your psychological uh, want out of it. And that's what, that's your culture and value. And that's what you want. And that's great. Show up, play, go home. That's perfect. But if you want to develop and you want to get better, it's important. It's really important. If you want your team to get better, it's really important to focus on individual conditioning and coordination. It addresses many issues that you can't fix with technical, uh, tactical, and rudimentary drills. You just can't. Okay? So now, training for uh, physical development. There's, there's two parts. Physical uh, execution, biomechanics, physical structure and movement. This is like ankle, wrist, wrist, and hip mobility, suppleness, which means flexibility. All of this is an important component of the physical part. Bioenergetics, it's cardiorespiratory. It's the fuel that you depend on as an athlete to perform. You can make improvements in here, but it's not likely to be from a coach, but a specialist. And then there's biodynamics. And this is something a strength and conditioning coach has direct influence over. And this is physical expressions like strength, speed, power, mobility, endurance. This is a very important aspect of training and you can incorporate it in. You can incorporate this into the physical training, the technical training that they have, and it works great together. I'll discuss this later, okay? And then there's anthropometrics, which is like your height and your body type. This is a constraining and limiting factor, but only in context. Because uh, one of our goalies, Renee Ingram, plays handball for a superstar wizard handball player who is probably five foot two and defies everything that there is about handball uh, expectations of height and body type he succeeded because of him his adjusting to his limitations and overcoming them and so anthropometrics is considered a constraining and limiting factor i can't get taller i can't change the type of body i am if i'm lean or if i'm heavy set that's likely to stay with me in my life i can improve it or make it worse but i can't change it Okay. 
All right, so now we look at the tearing apart the other, the tactical training pyramid. Now we're looking at the base again. We're looking at decision-making and problem solving. It's key, it's key. If you don't improve your decision-making and problem solving, you're not gonna do well in tactical drills. You're not gonna do well in small-sided games. You have to, in handball, you have to learn to read the situation and act appropriately. It doesn't mean you act the same way as the person next to you. Each There's a unique kind of personality to how people play, which is one of the great things about handball. You know, there's, there, there's a unique style that's independent of, of your characteristics and it's your personality. It's in your psychological makeup, but a big component is decision-making and problem solving. And if you're not working on skills for these, you're not gonna be able to play handball. Cause I've had lots of players come to me who've been physical beasts who just can't solve the 2v1. <laughs> they just can't understand in the end how to make it work. And it's because they, they, they're focused on the physical and think they can power their way through something that they have to recognize first before they can win it and defeat it. And that's important. Training for psychological development contains four basic areas. There's spirituality. Spirituality, meaning connection, control. That's important. Uh, comes back to culture and values of the team and also culture and values of the player. If culture of the team and the culture of the player don't meet, it's, it's hard. It's, a hard. it's hard to develop a player who's in the wrong place. I've had elite players who just wanted to play recreational and I've had recreational just want to play elite. It's, ha it's hard to match that. When the synergy happens and they're in the right place and they have the right opportunity to express themselves in the sport, it's, it's golden. Outside of that, it's difficult. But if you're, if you're a recreational team, you're not so worried. But if you're an elite team, it's hard. It's hard when you have recreational people who show up 20 minutes late and don't care. In the United States, we deal with that at all the clubs. I'm calling you out now. There's lax standards and, and, and little accountability in the club system in the United States. Half of them want to have fun. Half of them want to relive old glory. And the other half are now we're, we're 1.5, but we're, we got lots of halves, but it's important. Then there's emotion. This is hugely important for training. Confidence, self-awareness, regulating emotions, motivation, empathy, managing relationships. This has to happen uh, with structure. You develop these within your players. You can develop these within your players and you can ruin them within your players. You can ride, you can ride thoughtful people out of the sport and, 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 and stubborn players can, can ruin a coach's life. But it's important to understand that how you build your practice tasks affects confidence, self-awareness, and all of that. How you, how you, how you develop your, your team as a group, which we'll talk about, matters. Then there's cognition, decision-making, problem-solving, what we talked about. And then there's learning style and learning experience. Athletes are kinesthetic visual learners. They need to, they need to see it done and then they, they need to play with it in their brain and do it. And then they need to see it done and not be told it. I mean, most coaches don't realize that. You can't tell a player to do it the correct way. You have to show them. You have to replicate it, okay? And the, then there's the relationship between the persona, personality, the persona, and the psyche. Some players live hard and play hard. Some players have to fake it on the court and do well. And then there's others that get crushed by it. Handball is an intense sport. Some have to adopt a persona to, to, to play it because of the intensity and the spectacle of it. Handball it comes down, because it comes down to the duel, everyone gets isolated in that 1v1 and it's, you fail or you succeed. And it's a lot of stress. And, and learning to develop players is also teaching them how to manage stress, but also controlling their stress. If you have high mental demands, you have low physical demands. Christian is gonna talk about that in his lecture on uh, tomorrow. Uh, the, the fascinating lecture on planning. And I'm so appreciative of what he's going to talk about. And so these areas matter. So now we're going to finish with a look at the process itself. And we're going to run through an ideal situation. So we know the four domains. We know how uh, uh, technical, tactical, physical, and psychological can be developed. But what does it actually mean? And how, what are the stages? And so here's the process. And this is important to understand. Now it's got some bigger words and I tried to dumb them down. Early, intermediate, and late stage is the same as cognitive, associative, and autonomous, which 
that's the technical terms. I like introductory developmental and performance, but I really want to talk about the player development sub parts of this. When you introduce a task, a new technical skill, there's the presentation stage. That's your job as a coach. It's your job as a player to watch. But then there's the manipulation phase. And it's important to know the middle phase of each of the, or the middle micro phase of each of the phases is up to the player. The coach cannot touch that space. The, it's manipulation for players. That's why we do the rudiments. That's why we do the rudiments. And that's for the players. You just keep running the drills and let them in their brain. You can't make them understand it. They have to understand it themselves. That's why we do the rudiments. So I really want us to focus on manipulation on this idea that these middle stages, the first is manipulation. You've been given a task and now you're out there. What does this mean? Oh, I can't do it right. I'm doing that. And with repetition, you advance to the next phase. So the first phase is here. The next phase is in your like legs. It's associative. You're focusing everything on practicing it. So now I can do it. I can actually kind of do it against another player. I'm practicing it. But there's the middle phase, of, which is trial and error. And you have to let athletes fail and not discipline them during this phase. It's, an, it's a huge part. If you shame a player for trying something they're not ready to do and you encourage them to do it, you failed as a coach. Let me say that again. If you criticize a player, which then shames them for asking them to do something that you know in your heart they're not ready to do, that's on you and you'll lose that player. You gotta let them try it. Like I, I'll give you an example. I have a player on the women's junior national team and I've really been working on the dive shot with her to go from split step to dive shot with her. And I probably, I probably told her 40 times, just do it, just do it in a game. I don't care. It was the, the game was like out of hand. So we were already losing. And so I said, just go for it, just go for it. Just feel it out. And I could see her and she started to get success when she started to see, oh, if I, if I adjust here, I can do it there. And that's what's important. This trial and error phase is important. And then there's refinement. So after they come back from, from hey, I practiced it. I, I, now I'm putting it into action and I'm kind of failing. Then there's the refinement phase because then they come and they say, hey, you know what? I think I can do it better this way. And that's when they, the small little details come in. Like the one I said about the young woman from Germany who used her hand to control the defender when she did the swim move. And it's that little, that little, if you don't do a swim move with that hand in the controlling space, all the defender does is grab your hand and pull it back and neutralize the attack. But when you hold that arm down and they can't leverage their hips and you pull over it, you have it. And that's what's important for this phase. And then it comes to the last phase, high plateau. High plat, most players get, most players get to high plateau because high plateau could be at a low threshold, but most players get to high plateau. Most players don't get to mastery. Handball's an easy, it's handball's a simpler sport to learn the first 80%, but it's stubbornly impossible to learn that last 20%. That last handball, there are other sports like lacrosse, lacrosse is all front loaded. Lacrosse is impossible because of the finite learned tasks of technique just to even be out there and look conscionable. And so, but handball's the other way. Handball, we have, a, I love it because you can bring a lot of people in and get a lot of people moving, but there's a wall and a high plateau. And what matters for, what matters for player development is that the coach has to let the player choose mastery or not. And mastery takes going all the way back to the beginning, to the rudiment phase, to look at the hand. You don't master something until you learn each of, not that you have to master each of the technical actions that are made of the skill to master it. And a lot of people are sloppy in areas and they don't perform it perfectly. They perform it well, but not perfectly. But in, in mastery, it's when you go back and again, the coach doesn't, the coach has no control over this. You might be able to show video and tell them, but until they're willing to see it, they can't make the difference. And then there's decline and everyone declines. You decline when you go out, uh, uh, when you get away from the seasonal cycle and you decline because of age and you decline for other reasons, but decline some, most people go from high plateau to decline. Some go from mastery to decline, but everyone declines. You decline in the off season, you decline between games and declines a natural degrading process. And it's part of skill process. It's like what they say, you could, once you learn to ride a bike, you never forget, but you suck if you took like eight years off. And then you come back and then it's like, oh, wait, okay, I've got it. 
it takes a little bit because you had decline. Okay, and that. So now we're just gonna look at it sequentially and see what it is. Kid walks into my gym. Here he is. He's got some technical skills and no game understanding. He's never seen the sport before. This is the presentation phase. I'm gonna introduce him to some things. Now think about what I'm saying here because it's, this is hugely important. The, the introduction of the conditioning and the physical and the rudimentary skills is the very first part that you present. This is the manipulation phase. They might be stuck in, some will be, the kid that I showed the sidearm with, his manipulation phase was always eight minutes. Tegan can learn anything. Like I had introduced him to the sidearm in uh, the two weeks before that game that I showed you scoring all those sidearm goals. And he looks pretty good at it. He had only been trying it for about two weeks because he realized he was much shorter than some of the six foot five guys. But here we have manipulation. You put it at the base. The next stage after manipulation, is repetition. Now you're starting to see, you're still, look at your, your technical skills improved and you got a little bit of game understanding. You're not ready to put it on the court and you don't match yet. You're not doing it yet. Then you come to the next phase, which is practice. Now you're putting in under game understanding. And this is where, where teaching players to understand the context is so important because you can't get game understanding from playing, from doing a rudimentary drill. Not until the mastery phase. And you go back and re-examine everything, lay it on the ground in front of you and go, oh, crap, I didn't do that. That's what I'm missing. That hand on that defender's back was the slightest thing that makes me win that fight every time. But until you get game understanding, you can't see it. And then you add tactical skills. And then you have the first of the synergies. That's the refinement, the first, of the, the, the first time that it comes together for you. And now you can play in a way that's autonomous or that's almost autonomous, but is associative. And then you have the high plateau. And this is where most people get. They're, they're never this pretty. Actually, if you want to know the trick, I have a evaluation system that's one through five and I rate my players and I have triangles that look like this for my players. We're going to use a graphic like this as a representation. So keep this in mind when we go forward that this is a person. This is a player and it can be a coach too, which I'm gonna use as well. But so from my standpoint, I think it's important for you to understand this high plateau is our goal as a player and as a coach, because the mastery part, the mastery part, that's as high as you're gonna get. That's when you have, you have your, your gameplay will always be less than your game understanding because it's affected by the players around you as an individual. So you have to think about that concept. You can't, ex it's like exceeding a limit. You can't exceed a limit. It was never the correct limit then. So you can't, you can't exceed game understanding because it's a, it's, it's so contextual up there. It's so many things that are mattered that the, 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 the players around you, the cycle of fatigue, the substitutions, the game, the, the tech, the, the tactics, the strategy. So you're always going, but this is like a high level. This is, this is what you see when you see Norway. You know, if you're in this category here, of that's what you see when you see with Norway. You have a few mistakes, but you don't have many, you know, when you see the Norwegian women play. But this is important to remember because then you have decline. And the first thing to go is the body. You hold on. So it's like reverse. You came in with all your physical and no game context. And now you're all, you're losing, your decline happens physical first. Small into here and moves up it affects how you play with others but you hold on to some of your game context and your game understanding and that's development that's the natural cycle and it's important to remember this because tomorrow we're going to discuss this but we're also going to discuss this more and so as i end today i really want you to consider something focus on developing essential qualities and skills in the context of the game that's the most important thing you can do Everything needs to be in the context of the game. Even if you're just isolating, and you're not adding a game to it. It's a technical drill. You should be speaking. Remember, remember, this is what you have, you know, when you're, when you face this, remember what that guy did. All that information is huge as a coach to a player, but as a player, it's huge to know. Always highlight the interrelationships between game context and technical skills, between problem and resolution. And then it's a useful framing tool to work backwards from the game. I, I it, this is so like, if, if, Sometimes I look at my practice plan and I'm gonna be 100% honest. And I'm like, what am I practicing for? If I redo the reverse engineering and look at it from the game, I'm looking at why am I focused on 40 minutes of fast break training 
when uh, our team isn't the fast team going into this game and we might have four or five actual simple or extended fast breaks. Why would I spend 40 minutes when I can spend my time where it matters? So working backwards from the game is an awesome framing tool as a player also. What do I want to, how do I want to play and how do I get there? And then you have to remember that techno-tactical skills must be developed under game-like conditions. I said this before, I'll say this again. You, you might be able to perform a jump all you want, but jumping into a player who's running full speed and not knocking them out of the air, but neutralizing them, that's a hard thing to do. And then intervene only if the appropriate quality or skill is a limiting factor in game performance. Yeah, I want my guys stronger. Yeah, I want them faster. But what if I'm the fastest team out there? Why would I focus on being, the fa being faster when I could focus elsewhere and really talk about what's my limiting factor? And that's where evaluation comes in. As a player, you have to be honest. I said in the, my breakout, you have to have realistic expectations, but you got to be realistic in your self-analysis. It just as I have to be as a coach. OK, and so I really appreciate this deep dive because what comes next is just as important because now we show you how to do this. We show you the, the what works, what doesn't. So I'm going to uh, answer any questions. It appears that there are no questions. Um, we'll give you one perfect. more minute. I was perfect. <laughs> I, 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 I had to admit this is a fantastic presentation. Correct? It's, it's a I, deep I mean, dive. It's a deep dive, but it's important for people to understand these things. It's a really oh, deep I, dive. I can, see, I can see one question. Hold on. Um, it's from uh, Philip um, and, and Craig for the interest of time because I have uh, we I have Jerry Sigmund from the... Uh, I'll, I'll speak um, quickly. You was up to see if you can just quickly answer. How would you tailor this to kids? It, I, tailor it to kids by by leaning on the by leaning to the right side of the pyramid and not the left side right away. You'll lose kids, young kids. You'll lose kids if you focus on rudimentary skills because kids are going to go through different phases of development, and only when they're receptive to these for their age group. Should you, but this, I, that's my, that's, I have book on that. I have, it's a different thing. We're talking about clubs and with kids that are pubescent and likely in their sweet spots and older when I'm talking about this, I, you shouldn't look at young kids. You should look at young kids broadly because their anthropometrics aren't set yet. My son, I use this all the time. My son was four foot 11 when Julio and I brought him as a right wing to uh, Sweden and thought he'd always be uh, the lefty, the small wing. And now he's six, three. You know, and you don't, you don't know where kids are going to end up. So you have to be more broad in your development of kids and focus more on games and fun tasks than, than on the technical skills. And I'll leave it at that because we could, we could talk forever on that subject. <laughs> so, well, once again, what a fantastic presentation. I, I think um, it, it was worth the, uh, the time, uh, but I'm going to pass the ball now to Jared Sigmund from the uh, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee who's gonna uh, give us a short presentation about uh, strength and conditioning and the impact on what we're looking for. Uh, so with all the further ado, I'll open the floor to Jared. It's all yours. Thank you, you Julio. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for having me guys. I have my camera off because my uh, internet's not very fast where I am right now. I do apologize, but I'm gonna mirror a lot of things that Craig, I think said and hopefully just reflect it in a example way. So you guys can um, see through maybe like in a way to build it out for yourself. Perfect. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, my uh, my background because that I think that leads into my philosophy and, and why I do the way that the why I, I do the things I do, I guess. OK, so my background, um, I actually played a lot of sports growing up in high school. Um, and then from there, played college football and then went to uh, Minnesota, did my uh, master's degree in exercise physiology and stuff like that. Came out to the training center in Chula Vista, worked with a bunch of teams before London games, uh, most of them that are pictured here. And then I was a full-time strength conditioning coach with USA Rugby, uh, decision-making field-based sports. So I see a lot of commonalities with handball in this. Um, and now I work with mostly track and field archery uh, and some swimmers who come out. All right, so what makes a, a program work? I think all programs are based on solid training principles, um, having consistency, having buy-in from the coaches and athletes alike, and that creates the culture and the relationships to have that cohesiveness so we can talk 
uh, how was that session? How did you rate it? How did you feel? Those kind of questions at the end of the session that you can actually articulate for your judgments and how you periodize the next session or build off a session. The architectural structure, um, like what is hard and what is the physiological benefits of a person who is type two fiber or like a really fast person or who a person that can go forever and just run forever continuous with type one fiber. And how do you, where do we want to put those on the court and how does that fit in with the head coach's philosophy um, or the philosophy and type of player that you want to be in the skills that you choose. And obviously many more are going to go into this. Where did I start? Um, that's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of places you can go with strength conditioning and uh, sports performance. Uh, you'll hear these things. And um, I think it's all, all based on where you fit as an athlete into the philosophy of the coach and where you want to work and where you want to spend your time. Um, and it, and a, a thing that's always got to be a thing is the resources, right? So my philosophy is uh, it's like a, a four-prong four -prong approach. Um, basically the general preparatory exercises these are going to mirror the energy systems and the same movements of the competitive environment. Um, and then you have the specific preparatory exercises. These are going to be the same muscle groups, but a, a different form of movement. I'll give examples for each of these in the next slide so you guys can kind of picture what this actually means. Um, and then the special strength exercises is a combination of this. Uh, and then the competitive exercise is actually just basically doing the, the competition and no adjustments off of it. Um, so all the psychological, physical, um, tact technical and tactical demands all would be wrapped up into that. And then how do we periodize and plan this out longitudinally or like through a mi micro cycle, macro cycle and the quad. Um, this can kind of dictate as an SNC coach, where do you want to spend your time or where does the coach want to spend his time? On general stuff, basically the weights, the cardio, the prehab core, um, do we want to spend it on individual skills at a slow play, slow pace? There are components of the whole. Um, specific development exercises, small set of games. We feel like we need to break stuff out of uh, small stuff so we can fill the context of the game and then the environment of the game, but they can hopefully make better decisions or cleaner decisions and see where they are wrong. Um, or do, And we can use these small set of games to actually introduce more more conditioning or less conditioning by putting like, 3v4 if you're going to work on defense uh, or like four on two and then they got to do a breakaway drill and these two defenders are going back and forth um, and really working conditioning um, for numerous reasons why you'd want to do that and then obviously the competition so I think a good thing to hit on is always like warm-up I think it's the forgotten uh, period where we can actually introduce a lot of skill set and actually work in some of the physical uh, baseline aerobic baseline stuff components of it. Um, I like to design mine like this with, uh, again, basically four principles, kind of just off of that same principle, uh, the general. So low intensity, dynamic stretching. Uh, this could be like your lunges, your hamstring stretches, um, very basic stuff, just trying to get them moving. You could walk around as a coach, kind of ask them how they're feeling. Uh, did you sleep at all last night? Kind of these palms things that we, at the USOC, we track. Uh, we have them fill out a survey every day, and then we use that survey over time to see trends. Like, are we working them too hard? Are they not sleeping at night? It's like, so there's certain signs or indicators that athletes are being overreached or overtrained. Uh, you might have heard that term before. So that, that's a time where the coach can kind of walk around and feel out the session. If they have a good session plan, um, that's going to meet the players where they are today. Uh, general skills can be the passing back and forth, some defensive mirroring, very, very simple stuff that is in um, – uh, easy stage maybe it's just offense against no defense just how they can communicate back and forth getting that energy up before practice uh, moving the ball back and forth and talking is there a lot of chatter or do we have to spend more time on this uh, as a coach or can we move on to the next thing and get more specific throw another one defender in there so maybe it's 2v1s or you know 3v2s if they're ready for it and we've built that into our program as far as our like Craig was saying some of the tech, technical and tactical side um, but then actually going into game plan um, doesn't have to be, you know, right away off the bat. But I mean, most kids at whatever level, they actually are playing the game. So we have to prepare them at some point. You might not get them ready in 15 minutes for this actual gameplay, but it might be a small component of that gameplay or something that the head coach, if you're in a, have an assistant coach or you are the head coach and you are running, 
it kind of builds into your next session. I always, I always look at it and I have that conversation as an SNE, SNC coach or a sports performance coach with the head coach before practice. Hey, how does this look? Is this going to build in good with what you're going to work on? Are you going to work on that defensive stuff today? Are you going to work on offense stuff? Are we just going to, you know, just let them go? Or is it going to be a slower, more technical session where we can have time to talk back and forth? Or are we trying to get conditioning with all these components mixed in together? So that's always kind of a, a simple breakdown. Hopefully that is easy to introduce if you want to. And then the traditional models, this is actually just breaking down each microcycle. So a microcycle would be four weeks. And then obviously the, the warm up. there's gonna be multiple warm ups. You might do eight warm ups in a week if you have two sessions a day or just you know five warm ups within, within that um, session. So, and then from a lifting component, you might do, uh, I tend to do four weeks of each microcycle. So three weeks are going to be hard. And then that last week's going to be deload or taper. And then we'll do four weeks hard again, and then we'll taper here. And that builds into a meso cycle. So then we'd have a common theme for this meso cycle. A common theme might be hypertrophy. It might be strength. It might be um, just circuits. And we're just trying to build endurance. And then that's going to feed into the macro cycle. And this is going to be your yearly plan, things that you reflect upon after the season, what we need to work on uh, as a general physical component that we want to build into if the coach's philosophy is like run and gun then we got to get them ready to run and gun and do a lot of decision making stuff under fatigue um, and we build that into each of these sessions and we change our lifts so to be more maybe circuit based and have them make decisions during the lift or different components of lift they're not doing maybe the same simple squats they're doing variations of squats where they got to feel different positions so make them think a little bit maybe uh, maybe there's a ball in the gym where we're doing combination training so they're they're doing a skill and then they come back and forth. So some kind of pass sequence and then they come back and then they do their, um, you know, a burpees and then they go into push-ups. and just, you got to get creative with it, I think. And, and that's a great opportunity to do it. Um, but it's, it all builds back into whatever philosophy you want to start with here and then work your way down. So performance, I think this is something uh, most coaches don't realize um, assistants or head coaches, even at the, the level that I'm at, um, just general how how these things the motor abilities depreciate or go down um, from peaking or the optimal training say say we stopped training today because of COVID a lot of athletes basically couldn't train so what system is going to go first you basically your speed systems are going to deteriorate within uh, five days plus or minus right there's always that and then your ATP system so this would be like your your if I asked you to do a 40 today how how fast would you depreciate in your in your ability to repeat that so within five days you're going to be already seeing stuff go down you might be around a four or nine today and then all you're going to run you're going to run a five one next week you know um so we'd want to have this peak towards the end of it and then we'd obviously start here because that's not going to the half life's not as much on this uh, however you want to say it right um so then you have repeat power and then glycolytic energy and then there's nice little definitions um to kind of explain it a little bit further i can send these slides over too and then this could be how you would peak your athletes within, you know, those meso cycles. With if, if we have a, a heavy competition coming up, we just work backwards from this, right? From a physical standpoint. And this is going to be aerobic base and your strength. The strength usually stays like your max strength squats, your benches, and stuff like that. And then your aerobic capacities, you run like uh, oxidative energy capacity. I mean, it would be like run a mile or run two miles, stuff like that. Um, here's a nice study that uh, some kayakers. Basically, the ones that did um, the resistance training, they depreciated at half the rate. So, I mean, that's just within a couple weeks, too. So, it's just it's something, it's just important to keep consistent. Like I said in the beginning, if we can be consistent, it's going to reduce our injury, and we're going to be able to train at a higher, higher standard, and we're not going back and forth and fluctuating. Um, and then hopefully keep away from uh, those nagging injuries. Another thing that we should always consider is super compensation. Like I said, why, why do a deload? Why not just go high intensity all the time? Because this is when we're actually going to see all the hard work that we put in come to life. It's, it's basically like when we sleep at night, how much recovery, not only does our, our body recover, but our brains are going to recover too. So it's, it's the, the neural side. And then I think it's, this, it's, it's the thing that completes the training. I, I cannot emphasize that enough. And I think it's uh, sometimes we have to be creative how we get to supercompensation. Sometimes we might do five days on and then we might do two days rest, right? Like nor normal training, right? Sometimes you might do four days and three days off, you know, 
And then we just build that all off of competitions always. Um, it doesn't always have to be our five days, two. It can be a four, three. And we might do that for a whole micro cycle, right? Or we can do three days on super hard and do four days off if we're going to go into a holidays or Christmas. Like we're coming up um, pretty soon, right? So, so we can get creative with this, but it's something that we always have to, the, the harmony between, I think, that we have to think of. So just want to touch on that. Um, so how can we uh, score this or how can we make sense of this in a simple, easy way if we don't have like a, a GPS system or a heart rate monitor system? A simple way is basically duration of, of session in minutes and then an RPA. What is an RPA? Rate of perceived exertion. So you, can, you ask the athletes uh, at the end of the session as they're doing their cool down stretches, also some stretches at the end. Uh, was it a one through 10? What did you get? Uh, you know, I give you a six. It was just like a skill session. It wasn't that hard. Uh, but we did some running at the end. And then what was the duration of the minutes? It was an hour long. So then you got 60. And then you do have five of those. So that's maybe, maybe every day is at a six and we did it every day for an hour. So that's 600. So that would be in the range of a six. And then you add all these scores up within your micro cycles, right? And then you build out a volume. And not that any volume is right or wrong. You're just looking for trends within this volume. All right. It's just a way to see like, where are we trending? Are we trending towards a 10 every day for a long time? Um, so there's a lot of research on this too. So we have to be careful. We do three hard days in a row. Uh, hard day probably is for most people. Obviously there's going to be outliers and athletes. Some, some might rate a session that you think is a, a five at a 10, but you just got to consider that and average that out within your players. Just keep it in your my, back of your head as a coach. I think we're really good at this. We kind of know what distances are running, what time constraints. You just write that down as a, a number each day. So you don't have to write all these 1,050. You just write down a 10 each day. And then you track that for trends. But when we see uh, three hard days in a row, that's where we should kind of be like, maybe I should back off a little bit. There, I've been, we have 30, we have 40. You know, that score is starting to get pretty high. Uh, that's where we're going to see injury. Um, injury usually occurs when you have the, not to get too technical into math terms like that, but when you get into that 120%, three days in a row. So if you were, you know, you usually trend between a seven, seven, and it's going to be a chronic workload versus an acute, acute workload. All right. So if we have an acute would be like your week, but then your chronic is going to be your two week average, at least of all the volume that occurred. Hopefully that makes sense. So if you had a two week, two week average and it's a seven, and then all of a sudden you did three days of hard stuff and you're at 10, 10, 10, that's going to be above 100. 20%, right? So then we should start to just be aware of what we're doing in our next session. That's all. It's just a simple, easy way to be aware of what we're doing so we don't put our athletes at risk. All right. So I want to get into like a, just show like a general uh, conditioning uh, template that you guys can use. And I just broke it down by a block and then a week, uh, one to four. And this was more um, aerobic in nature. So if you have a three-day week and you're going to do like three days of conditioning, say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, with, so just to talk like a background more for me and my philosophy. So uh, coming from rugby sevens, it was more of like, we need to catch up our skills compared to the New Zealand's, uh, the Australia's and stuff like that. So we, we didn't do too much of running for running sake. We always had a skill or a game drill type into it. So if it was, um, you know, tempo runs back and forth at 70%, uh, we do one rep, and then we take a five-minute rest, grab water, go to the bathroom, and we come back, and we do five sets of that one rep, you know, rest in between. They're, they're passing the, bo the ball back and forth, doing a weave, you know. They're talking, communicating. They're getting touches. They can work on the skill development in, in between um, just to catch it up. So it, does, it can be fun. It doesn't always have to be just mindless running, right? We can have good energy and, and start to build that culture around the team. Um, and then these are just percentages maybe off their 100% max if you, if you tell them to run at 70%. So if they're max, if you have a heart rate and you have them take their heart rate after each, um, like a, a max effort running a mile at the end, you're going to get their max heart rate. So then you could do a percentage off of that, just times it by 0.7, right? And then you take their heart rate after each of these five minute intervals and you make sure that's at around 70%. Then you know, oh, they're, run, they're working at 70% that whole time. And can they learn how to manage their heart rate and their work capacity at that 70% for five minutes? That's a, that's a tricky thing for some athletes and just getting that awareness so they can conserve energy for those next five reps. And then you don't want this to be a hard day, maybe, uh, you know, thinking at the big picture of things, there's going to be days and you're at the beginning of the cycle 
Um, so it's nice and easy, and hopefully the, the benefits are there. Um, so you just build up 5% each day, so then you're going at 80% of their max heart rate, okay? And then week two, go again. Just kind of builds off of that. Week three. Okay. And then we got our D load built in again. So, I mean, these durations you guys can play with. You guys are going to know that better as a, as a handball community, but it's, it's an example. It's a template to kind of start off and build off of. So then you got your week five to eight, more aerobic, complete lactate clearance. So their ability to clear lactate, um, hopefully they can do that with a two minute rest in between. And then in the next block, we're working an incomplete lactate clearance. So, uh, you know, this is very linear in nature, right? You're starting aerobic, you're building that base endurance, then you're starting with a complete lactate, then you're going to do incomplete lactate, and then you're going to do speed endurance where they can't keep up and mentally they're under fatigue. Um, I put in some of these days where, where it's run, no turn. So this would just be like run continuous. Uh, maybe it's around a track, a circular, or you take your, your court, you break it off, you put cones, and they can run continuous around it, no turns. How that's going to change versus the, the one turn obviously you're going to have a hard d cell or a, a d cell and then an acceleration so those are more, more physiological you're going to break down the muscle tissue more it's going to have different demands on the quads um and if you're doing depending on the intensity 80 80 to 85 percent is pretty pretty fast um going back and forth so you're going to get some a lot of reps if you're doing this for you know 30 seconds 30, 30 second reps uh this is uh, about 20, 20 reps there at 30 seconds on off. And it depends how you choose your distance too. If you want to choose your distance, you want your um, group to get a lot of hard XLD cells in, really work those muscles. They, they need to work on their change of direction stuff. You can do that here. Um, or you can spread the distance a little farther. So just simple stuff. And then you can work a scale into it. And then I usually like to do uh, that third day as more of a, a lighter intensity day, um, just to kind of back off them if I've done too much earlier in the week, but I'd rather get the higher work quality in the beginning of the week than, um, and then try to just build off of volume at the, uh, because the risk of injury is going to be higher at the end of the week, right? So you're going to be considered, we fatigue them, we fatigue them when they're fresh from the weekend. Um, this was a, a 5-2 uh, version, and then, then we can back off a little bit. And then we just build off of that as far as sets, reps, or intensity in this 5v8. Download on that fourth week. And then we got the same thing, a little high intensity. So incomplete lactate, we're going to work basically 90 to 95%, five to eight sets, six reps within each set. So that's a lot of volume. And then we're going to do 20 seconds on, 10 second rest. You saw the last one was basically a one-to-one. -one. This is a two-to-one. So you're working for 20 seconds, only taking a 10 second rest. And then I do a progressive addition of rest just because they're, going to, they're not going to be able to keep up. So you can do like a, so you can get creative with this too. It might be not a minute and 30, you might need two minutes, but then add 30 seconds in addition to that. So you might go in between these sets, these five day sets, you might go a minute 30 on the first one. The second one, you might go two minutes. And then the next one, you might go 230. You might go three minutes. You might be all the way up to five minutes by the uh, eighth set there. All right. And then they're doing six reps of this, 30 seconds on basically, 20 seconds on hard, and then off 10, okay. So hopefully that makes sense. If you got questions, feel free to, you know, ask them as we go. And then deload, I go back to a one-to-one, one-to-one, -to -one, and then just really light tempos at the end. Say seven minutes on, uh, one rep, and you're doing that three times something simple and you could do a run or you just skill or whatever in, in between there. And then speed endurance, go up to hundred percent. You go back to a one-to-one, -one, eight reps, three minute rest in between. So the rest is gonna be a little more higher. So it's basically, uh, so they can hit these top speeds because if we decrease the rest too much, they're not gonna be able to hit their speed, uh, their speed zones to actually work on speed. Um, so you're gonna, if you slow the tempo down too, and this could be even used. This could be even used for you know small sided games, all all that kind of stuff too. Just go 15 seconds, take a 15 rest. Coach says a couple things that we're working on, cues, things to be aware of, um, find space or whatever it is, and then we jump back into it. You know, go back and forth. Um, it's pretty pretty straightforward, I think, which is nice. And it's a pretty simple way to build out a whole 16 weeks of your conditioning. Your conditioning games, small set of games. 
can we get into lifting cards um, or lifting, weightlifting? Um, just want to show like this is the what, template I use basically. Uh, I think warm-ups we can't underestimate them enough, and it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, I tend to do a lot of like cardio warm-ups. So that could even be stuff that you would, if you got a rower, bike, stuff like that, you can do that. Or you can just jog in place, do some skips back and forth, you know, shoulder rolls, stuff like that, lateral karaoke's, change of direction stuff. Um, if you got a partner, you could do it off each other, uh, like little quick races from the ground, from a push-up position, from a lunge position. You say go, I say go this one. Um, some knee tags, stuff like that. You could do for 10 second time, 20 second rest. Um, little games like that, foam roll a little bit, soft tissue stuff. Um, if you're gonna go into a lunge and your hip flexors tight, obviously roll out those hip flexors. Um, that's the time to do that. And then some ground-based mobility, all fours, some cat camel, some yoga positions, donkey kicks, circles. Most of these you can YouTube or um, Google if you don't know, but it's just working yourself through a, a range of motion, feeling what's tight and getting you ready for basically uh, intense movement. Um, here's this is a body weight lifting card, so it's uh, you guys can use this if you want, or feel, it, feel free to use, switch it out, use it as a template. Um, yeah, so it's just basically upper body, lower body, upper body, and then some core, total body every day, upper body, uh, some cardio. So this mountain climbers will get your heart rate up a little bit, side plank, some glute activation in there. So it's just a solid um, lifting workout. So Another push-up variation, slow down. So you do a five-second tempo down, upper body push, lower body. We're going to do uh, body weight squats, five by 10. A tricep exercise. Oh, I'm going to mess that one up. So that should be a lower body. Um, single leg RDL. So you're working on balance and stability. And then we have trunk or core, windshield wipers back and forth, no rest. Okay. And then how you read the card is just sets, reps. So obviously, how many sets of how many reps we're going to do intensity so you can use rpe as the intensity like i was talking about earlier instead of saying like 20 or 20 or 30 pounds you could say uh, let's go a effort of four so it's pretty easy you know um, a tempo or a rest so what kind of tempo would i use for each exercise or what kind of rest period would you have in here and then just notes what kind of exercise selects you want in here and then you would fill it in um whatever basically weight or whatever uh check mark you want to put in here some people like to put what color band and then what kind of reps. Some athletes get really creative more than I even appreciate probably. <laughs> but yeah, it's just a good way to manage it, uh, to keep track of where you're going. So then off the next block, you could modify it, right? Um, Bulgarian squats, a single leg squat with your rear foot elevated, dead bugs again, and toe touches, stuff like that. So just a solid program I want to throw in there for you guys. And this one's uh, maybe a little more intense. So it's uh, Monday's an upper body day, Tuesday's a lower body, um, Thursday's a kettlebell circuit day, and then Friday's a lower body. All right. Then you get your warm ups in here again, barbell warm up. So if you do have access to weights and you want to get into that, just kind of going through different barbell patterns um, shrug to toes, RDLs, bent over rows, front squats, curl to press, overhead squat, uh, good morning, split squats, sumos. Kind of like all the solid compound movements that you'd really do. Um, some jump rope to get your heart rate up and then a strength prep pushing you through different ranges of motion, different planes. Um, and then basically all your pushing exercise with a ply out. So this be like a, a complex, if you probably call it, or a superset. Um, back and forth, pull-ups with a core. Renegade rows would be a core with a tricep. And then just building off that. Most important stuff, you always want to do first, least important you want to do last. And, you can have all of this. and then just to finish up, cool down, soft tissue work. I think these are all hyperlinked to, um, so you can click on them, but just stuff that are, that are going to come up if your fascia in the bottom of your foot is sore, you want to roll it out with lacrosse ball. Um, so you can click on that. Foam roll your hamstrings, foam roll your quads, hip flexors, like I was talking about earlier. Just a simple myofascial release technique. And then, yeah, yeah, all this stuff you, I mean, I kind of talked through like how to progress and just, I think always progress for your situation and your resources and time you have. And I think always try to keep it fun and, and always do talk with your athletes, how they feel, where it's going, and then what kind of strategies you want to, we want to go back and forth off of. And then I'll open it up for questions.
Well, Cody, first of all, let me say how much I appreciate that uh, thorough, 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 awesome. I'm going to go back and watch it. I'm in administrative mindset, so I'm, I want to go back and watch it. And just so you know, we came out of the same program at University of Minnesota. So I was under oh, Dr. Nice. Lisa Kyle in kinesiology sports management. So <laughs> it's, it's good to see a gopher out in the world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so I really, we really appreciate it. I think for time's sake, we're going to move through this. Um, I'd like, can I, can you uh, I'll email you later, but I'd like to get a copy of your uh, presentation. Um, yeah, for sure. hundred percent. I really appreciate, really appreciate you, Julio. It's up to you. And if it's possible, Jared, if you can just type your, uh, we'll defer the questions, but perhaps to email setting, because we have some people that they are watching in Europe. So it's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. We're pushing almost midnight over there. So if, if it's okay, you can type your, uh, any type of, um, you know, contact and information uh, for, for us to eventually I'll let you go. So he has yeah. already uh, typed his uh, email in, um, in the chat room so we can actually uh, defer any questions to him uh, at a different time. I know I have questions, uh, but that's for another time. <laughs> thank you so much, Eric. Thank you. And I like yeah. the, the, the transfers of a skill from rug, rugby to to handball. They're very similar sports in terms of the tactics and all that. So good job. Thank you. Yeah, I would totally agree with you. The decision-making component of it and how we can execute that under fatigue or not under fatigue and then periodize that out is huge. And I like the fact that you that you sit with the coach and you ask about there's no that you guys are not operating in silos like you know mm -hmm. you're just run your own routine because this is what you think is appropriate that you are actually connecting with the coach and asking hey what are you gonna do today so I can actually base my my work uh, my physical work based on your the tactical or technical ideas you will be working on so thank you so much for your time yeah thank you guys for having me appreciate it thank you Jared. Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. We'll jump into six now, right? Uh, Craig? Yep. No, lecture five. Don't go five. Away. Hold on. I got to reconstitute stuff. Somehow I lost my screen. I'm not sure. Everybody has the screen, correct? Just want to yes. make sure. Um, hold on one second. I lost my panel. Just one second. Everybody take a deep breath. We're regrouping, moving into the... I don't know what happened to my panel. Hold on, I'm going to stop share a second. Just one second. Lost it again. Okay, I'm just going to go with it. I'm going to start the slideshow. Um, not sure what I hit. Okay, let's do this. All right, everybody. Uh, I am here. Is slideshow going, Julio? No. No. Okay. Hit it. There you go. There we go. Now I'm back. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for. Uh, I was a very thorough. I. I need to sit down and watch that uh, uh, again and take notes and get a copy of it and, and analyze it. I loved it. Um, I want to now have us move uh, from. So we went from the development process to the act or the development concept to the development process now. And um, we're going to start uh, with individual exercises for technical development. We're going to discuss uh, the types of exercises in this category uh, or the three categories in this. And, uh, and, but first, I must tell you of my friend Benny Dasser of AbsoluteHandball.com. Uh, he developed uh, one of our players, Paul Skarupa, on our national program, and I've known him since 2015. And because we cannot train and I cannot film the training segments, he 
uh, he allowed me to use his training segments uh, for practical purposes, which was a relief to me because they uh, were perfect for what we're about to discuss and freed me from violating COVID protocols. So thank you, Benny of absolutehandball.com. Check them out. A lot of great uh, drills and exercises in there, many of which we're going to go over today. Um, the component that we're looking at right now, member sitting situated next to physical and uh, psychological was technical skills. And we're now looking at uh, technical skills and uh, in three categories, how to develop them. Uh, we're going to begin with conditioning drills, which are uh, development of motor skills and conditioning. Uh, we're going to have rudiment drills, what we talked about, development of isolated technical actions, and technical drills, which are development of complex technical actions. Pulling apart to look again, these are the three areas we're focusing on in this lecture um, because they're focused on the individual, and we really want to uh, show you how to go about this and give you some examples that you, you can use. Remember, this is an overview. When we do future coaching certification and symposium courses, we'll deep dive into this. I could go on forever, but we're, this is an overview. I'm providing examples and I'll talk through it. And Julio will provide examples and he'll talk through it or I'll talk through it for him. But we'll, we'll discuss the, uh, what matters here, which is the theoretical translation into practical means, but not deep dive the practical. We're going to start with conditioning drills. It's important to understand. Cody talked about this. I've talked about this. Condi conditioning drills develop coordination and condition upon which all technical skills and movements, movement patterns rely. Speed, coordination, power, strength, mobility, endurance. These are just a few of the expressions. They're non-cognitive, no decision-making. They're non-technical and they're non-tactical. They're isolated from the sport. They're not directly involved in technical skill development, but are greatly influential in the process if used as a tool in conjunction with things we'll learn later. And I'll discuss this and show you. I'm going to go through a series of videos. And here's jump training. Um, sorry. This is going to go through a cycle of different exercises. These are important to consider when you're developing athletes. Jumps attached. Now we're going for distance. Two footed power, two footed jump, pivot, two footed jump, backcourt, block. All of these things, these conditioning are part of developing athletes. It's important for you to understand that you can vary these, but you need to be consistent with them. All of these develop play athlete uh, characteristics and attributes, but completely devoid of the game. Lateral steps, sidestep. Remember, this is for development of sidestep. All of these are in conjunction and coordination with skills you need, but improve them. Now we have more jumping. This is the second level of jumping. Now we're working at, at box jumps, coordination and jumping. That's a jump roping skill. Now we're working at, this is rudiment. This could be, these are tools we use for rudiment training. Weight transfer, balance, high hurdles. Okay. Now we're working at coordination and speed. All of these are exercises when we're, when we're building the base for athletes. Different foot patterns. Remember I talked about the second level, the second level, the progressive level of development for skills in handball footwork is foot patterns. You can use any type of instrument or uh, tools too. He's using hula hoops. I like hula hoops because they're higher profile and they force. That's a good thing to know. I've seen people tape squares. I've seen people, the, I like to use, I've seen the other people use it, not a little bit higher profile tools, 
for them. So they actually have to clear it instead of target it. And so that's important. So we have conditioning drills. All of these develop the athlete at its base. Now that this is psychological, it didn't have any problem solving. It can be translated to handball, but it's not handball. It's conditioning and coordination. Now we go to rudiments. Now rudiments are interesting. I'm gonna really focus on rudiments because in my uh, uh, handball at school life at the IHF, we're all about small games for children and all this stuff. But rudiment drills are important and they need to be done in the right time. Remember we talked about presentation and manipulation. That's the phase you need it. And then come back at mastery as well. You don't need, if you're in the autonomous phase and they're at the high plateau and they've kind of given up, the rudiment's not gonna help them. It's their choice to go at that. And it's not, you shouldn't focus on team prep, but in the early development stages of teams, rudiments are important um, if done properly and if done in the right amount at the right time, okay? And so that's what's important from, from my standpoint. And so they're developed the basis of basic movement skills and technical actions in isolation, ball manipulation, footwork. Anything can be a rudiment as I'll show you. They're isolated actions, high repetition, no contact. Remember the difference between collision and contact? The drills we just saw were high collision contact or high collision drills. These are no contact, I mean, no one touches you. They're non-cognitive and they're basic complexity. It, it should be simple. It's not, it's an isolated technical action. Best in the early stage of technical development, but important later in the process too, during intermediate and late stages as we talked about. Rudiment drills for development and attack. I'm gonna deep dive for a minute here because I think it's important. The methodology behind it is they're essential for introducing, improving, and strengthening technical skills in attack. Okay, skills are broken down into essential parts. Like, like there, you you look at the you you stand back and you see the coordinated movements. Well, each of those movements that have to be coordinated together to meet a technical skill can be improved and can be isolated. They are practiced, improved, and strengthened. And here's the interesting part. And this is the essential part of manipulation. They can be practiced forwards, backwards, or non-sequentially. You can take it from different angles. And in the manipulation phase after uh, skill introduction, you can take it apart and say, well, we're just gonna focus on this. And I'm gonna show you how to do it uh, with uh, wing shots, uh, the three quarter wing shot and how to break it all the way back. Okay, and then we're going to talk about how you can use all sorts of apparatuses, hurdles, ladders, alternative balls, etc. Because rudiment drills allow you some flexibility and creativity. You can walk into a, uh, a closet at a school in a PE room and look and almost manipulate anything into some sort of rudiment drill that can be used and employed. Uh, we begin with movement and footwork. There's setup, there's landing, there's start from landing. There's balance and weight transfer. There's lateral explosiveness. There's with and without balls, different ball types. And here we go back to my two basic comp or my two main ideas. Rudiments are also important because they are variable patterns in and out and sequencing from and to. You can add and you can find the parts that connect the, the split step to the jump shot. There's an intermediary between there and you can develop that as well. So the ligaments, per se, that hold the, the technical uh, uh, skills together can be, or together as separates can be used too. You can use steps, you can use hurdles, resistance bands, resistant cords. I'm into those. I'm, I'm really into the resistance bands. I like to work with players. Like, like there's nothing like working on the split step, but having an elastic band that then pulls them and lets them see the power that they can generate from it. Passing and catching, catching high, catching low, stationary, moving, improving wrist strength, imbalance, resistance, different ball types, variable patterns again, sequencing from and to. Faking, setup, movement fake, in and out. Remember, ins to hand, outs, or ins to strong, outs to weak. Passing fake, overarm, bounce, wrist, backhand, shooting fake. You know, running, all of these uh, fakes can just be, can be isolated. You can work on, you can work on your, sh your running shot fake. Just in isolation, I can just be doing this and work on it. I can work on my hand strength to hold the ball to be able to do it without glue. Cause that's usually becomes a technical problem for us in the United States. Cause we can't use glue and we can't properly train them because in Europe they can just use the normal ball size and get adjusted to it. And here we have to go down a ball size. So we have proper uh, positioning in the hand for support. There's dribbling and bouncing, setup, direction, alternating courses, ball types, variable patterns again and sequencing from and to. They're shooting, general and positional, set up, seated, from set, or from step, from box, from landing, targeted, coordinated, imbalanced, resisted, obstacles, hurdles, air bodies, 
Again, variable patterns. But with shooting, there's no sequencing to, there's only sequencing from. Because the shot is the finalization of the phase. So I want you to take a look at this a second. We're gonna talk about the traditional wing shot and how to re reverse engineer it. But I want you to get the image in your mind before you do. Look at her up there. She's got her arm in the high position. And now watch. So the normal wing shot, there's gonna be two, very, two of it, three quarter shot. Again, here it comes again from the other side. Up in the air, high to three quarter slice. Beautiful one. That was an awesome one. Okay, now we're going to discuss and we're going to get wordy. And this is where the COVID era ruined this lecture for me. And I look forward to when I can go back and film the segments of this, because this shot can be developed in so many ways. And I'm going to say it slowly and effectively so you understand how to do this reverse engineering wise. Okay, here we go. The reverse engineering of the three quarter jump wing shot. Start from the landing. Player stands in the court has his hand up in the air or her hand up in the air and begins the three quarter shot at the far post and in from a hop to just about landing. And the tree, everyone knows the wings touch the ground the same time that they're throwing and you want to train that. Every top wing does it and they train for it. And the ones that don't do it, don't do as well. And it's just wait and throw. And so from a hop, stepping off a box. Remember the boxes we saw in the drills just a couple minutes ago? You can step off a box and as you're about to land, do the three quarter shot. You can do the land from the high, or the shot from the high position standing on the box. You can do it from the step, even lower. You can jump to the step and do the shot. You can do it from the approach to the jump from the step. And this is where it gets important because you're backing it up. So basically you have the time in the air to landing and you shoot, but the time that's before it, you can arrange as well because those are all the ligaments that hold it together. All the complex skills that go into it, the approach, the catch, the jump, the throw, the land, all of that, turning the hips can be broken down. You can start, the, you can start from the jump. You can start from the corner. You can start from, start from an obstacle course that comes to the corner. You can start from a joint technical action with a backcourt player to the corner. You can even add a technical action, a coordinated task to the corner, to the wing shot. Okay. And all of this can be done with various ball types. All of this can be done with, with diminished angles. You can arrange the course to go at what angle you want, train them. You shouldn't just train them to shoot the easiest wing shots. Wing shots sometimes are hard and so you should close off that angle. You know, the men's national team has Max from Sweden. And the first time I saw him warm up on the wing, he takes end line shots. His approach is straight down the end line with the three quarter uh, wing shot. And he scores a lot of them on goalkeepers, on good goalkeepers. And all of this can be done with a goalkeeper using side defense techniques at the same time. The best drill you can do is start a player off standing in the zone where the wing would land. And the goalie is where in the side defense starts from the, the, the outside position and it's a race. And they can just start with this and they can start working on the timing. They're both doing rudimentary drills together because the goalie, it's hard to do it in isolation. At some point, the goalie needs context. And so these are important things to consider with rudimentary drills. I'm gonna show you some. I'm gonna show you how they build rudimentary drills. Sidestep, working on sidestep, that's all he's doing sidestep with an obstacle and the ball. You could do it without the ball at first and then add it as you go. Sidestep without landing, sidestep with landing, sidestep from pass, sidestep against a person and a little bit of decision-making. He's showing him it, but that's not decision-making. It's just visual cueing Sidestep from the tighter angle through two things, through a gap from the step. And don't worry about the finalization because the footwork was sound. Again, remember the, the shot is only one part of the component, but the most important part is getting to the shot. And so, so what I have for you now is rudiment drills and defense and for Julio.
My bad. Okay, I was like, um, I, w- I was saying really quick. One of the things about uh, a full control of the rudiments is that it actually leads to improvisation. So you can basically automatically are becoming a multi-dimensional uh, player because you have control of everything. It's very easy to adjust to every single uh, uh, game situation if you have mastered the, the rudiments that might lead to something more, um, you know, more complicated um, uh, actions. So the methodology in terms of the defense is, is, is very similar, obviously, uh, from the other perspective, yeah. you know, but uh, in, in my opinion, you know, the, this rudiment drills are essential. If you can come back one. I'm oh, sorry. Just come back. They're essential for uh, introducing, proving, and straightening technical skills in defense. So that summarizes, you know, what I, um, what I just said. You know, skills are broken into essential parts. Essential parts are practiced, improved, and strengthened following the pyramid that Craig has been talking about. Uh, and they can be practiced in different uh, uh, environments different uh, um, equipment as well, and improvisation. Come back, uh, next. What we're gonna talk about the posture, it's important to work, uh, to talk about the coordination. And another thing that I, that I, that I emphasize on the training uh, coordination and rudiments is not only for, um, for the, the skill development, uh, the skill uh, development of, of what is needed, but also for injury prevention, just your training already your, your body to actually execute the exercise, um, you know, in, in the correct way and in, in actual, uh, with a correct pro- progression. So talking about coordination uh, of the posture in a restraint and restricted against resistance with a course, with an A body, with dissuasion, almost like, like, like we were doing on the attack. For controlling the attacker, the same thing. You can work it with coordination uh, in an imbalance or ba- imbalance or balance environment you can do with uh, obstacles, hurdles, etc. You can work it with a ladder, you know, just like uh, I, I also like the idea of, of using the, uh, the hula hoops so you can create some texture to the exercise. Restrain, unrestrain with uh, rules, without rules, and forcing the cognitive decision making, you know, forcing the psychological aspect of the actual uh, decision making process. You know, sometimes we we'll ask yourself, well, he's so good but he always uh, makes the wrong decision. And part of it is because we have not actually little by little progress into uh, teaching uh, uh, them how to make the, uh, the right uh, decision. And obviously the ball control is important. You know, I, I stressed it in my, in my previous presentation and I'll, I like to continue to stress the, uh, the, the, uh, pr- the defensive progression, you know, like you first this way, you try to anticipate the pass and then you defend the ball. Um, from different angles, from different dimensions, from different uh, uh, optical um, um, positions, so you can actually train that as well. And obviously, uh, for the blocking part, you know, we need to work on the timing, we need to work on the coordination, you know, in the uh, physical needs uh, or the, the physical um, uh, requirements to make the exercise um, um, in a, a positive way, um, so we can be uh, successful. Kit, uh, some, some exercises right here. So the, the, uh, the defender is, is controlling, controlling the space uh, by just using his body and guiding the, uh, the, uh, the attacker to where they want it to be. Now we're talking about like uh, control and passing around. Uh, as you can see, the optical position is important, how he went from from when uh, one dimension to the other. Now we're talking about the uh, col- collaboration between, uh, you know, the the correlation between the and the piston uh, movement. And now we're talking about a little bit about, you know, the importance of understanding um, the uh, the rudiment of blocking in different game situations. So when we come back uh, now, and we'll we'll divide this up again. Um, when we come back now, I want to recap that because we spent a little bit of time on rudiments because rudiments are important. Uh, rudiments are important because this is about the player. And this is something we're in isolation. This, these are things that players can do 
during the COVID era to improve things. You should watch a game and watch the small little lineaments and ligaments that that can that control the spaces together, that, that control the skills together. And it's really important because like you can do stuff like like the I've been talking, I'm using an example, the woman's hand uh, uh, to control the space when she does the swim move. Ball must be low so they can't get your arm. And doorways are a great thing. You can actually actually do the 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 in step through a doorway hold the door and step through with it and be thin and it's like a gap and it, you can learn things you we have to be creative in this era and we have to know how to uh improve ourselves and we're gonna have to this is this is about the player and the player has shouldn't wait to be made the player should make him or herself and force the coach to adjust to the bet his own his or her own betterment it's not the other way around waiting for me to fix you is is not gonna is i have a role in impossible that task. but it's an impossible task to fix fix everything and it, it, it and and the players that we have and the players in the u.s system uh uh because they're new to the sport the the players we see out in like when we go when julio and i were at the junior worlds coaching last year they're so technically proficient because they've gone through these phases that we are just experiencing for the first time at a world championship they did and when they were 14 or 15 and they were in the german bundesliga youth bundesliga and working their way up uh to uh try to win it you know they already had that and so we come in late to development in the united states but doesn't mean we don't follow the same things and technical drills are essential here you know right. a technical drill is a develop is the develop the, the techniques of tactical movements patterns into basic movement skills sidestep piston movement they're isolated context important to learn that way series of combined technical actions increased complexity low cognitive demand low level decision making it doesn't mean no decision making like i said the visual cue is important the holding up a jersey. If I hold up my jersey, a green jersey, you shoot uh, to to hand, or you you move to hand. If I hold up a yellow jersey, you move to you move in, and so it's uh, or out. You just it's it's so much that you can do within this. It's best in the early uh, in, in intermediate stages of technical skill development, uh, technical drills. Uh, the, we're going to discuss in depth tomorrow coaching plans and cycles and in season what you should and shouldn't do technical drills are the mainstay of late uh late preseason right the the right before you've done your physical you're preparing uh technical drills are important in that beginning phase of late preseason because you've kind of let we haven't had the ball We've been doing rudiments and conditioning and all that. We haven't had a ball. We give you the ball. The first days are some fun, but then it's to work on technique. Okay. And that's, what's important. Uh, our methodology is practice technical skills in open space or isolated game context with obstacles and passive attackers or defenders for visual cues. Visual cueing is a huge thing. Proximity, space, width and depth. It all matters. Closeness to the uh, starting, starting a one V one, at 14 meters is a waste of time. What are you going to do after it? <laughs> you're out of options and you're only to 12 meters, you know? And so understanding that having that spacing and uh, goes, uh, goes a long way into developing skills. You utilize isolated game context only for continuity and reinforcement of the learning objective, direction, orientation, proximity to goal, speed of approach, focus on variability of patterns and personal preference. This is something important that Julio just said. There's going to be a unique style, like the kid who shot the shot, shot the goal at the beginning of the game uh, or at the end of the game, but at the beginning of the understanding the player uh, lesson that I know when he's in trouble that I need to have him do a Spanish cross with the right wing and he faints to the right wing and goes up in the air and rips one off and it like it unseals him. It just makes him feel at home. It's his shot. He's got a really dynamic uh, uh, crossing fake and comes right into the hardest rocket ever. It's probably the shot he wanted in that situation, but there wasn't a player to collaborate with him, which we'll go over tomorrow. But that's the key is understanding that personal preference matters. Focus on sequencing from and to and increase speed and repetition only with quality. Quality must be the dictator. If, they, if they're sloppy with it, take a step back. 
If they if they're proficient, challenge them. Remember, we we do well when we're asked to do something that's just exceeding our abilities. If we ask too much, we quit. If we ask too little, we quit. But we keep going that carrot the, the carrot theory. Hang it out, just challenge them a little bit. So but you have to demand quality and expect quality of yourself in it to do it. Cuz remember, tactic uh, techno tactical synergy is our goal. It's not like it's not like a myth of, mythical mythical place we're going to arrive at only with 2% of our athletes. Every athlete can have it if they try. It just might be at a different level, but they'll at least be able to do what they know how to do and do it in this game and reflect that, which is always the goal. And here we go. We're going to start with uh, individual uh, technical drills for development and attack. There we have a hurdle, but we're doing it. It's improving it. See, look, they're complex actions. Here we go with the decision. Obstruction, but it's still the same technical action. I push the other goal over and use it as the obstacle they shoot over. I face it the other way, face it the same way as the first one and do it. But these are all drills that aid in the development of te individual technical skills. And here we go. There's a joint skill because we have the whole progression, but these are important. But you're telling them what the difference here is you're telling them what to do. They're not choosing. You're pre-scripting everything. That's the difference between a tactical game and this. They're not making decisions unless it's finalization decisions. They're only making decisions when it comes to, or I mean, they're, they're not making anything. You're telling them, I, wanna, I want this shot and I want this pass. Because you have to learn it before you can do it in a game. And you have to learn it well. And here for Julio, we have some, uh, I'll let him speak over. We have uh, two, two videos of defense technical training. No, as you can see, the, uh, in, in, this, in this exercise, we're trying to work on, on, on control of the player. Uh, and it, it progresses to control of the player and the shooting arm. Um, it, it, it's a little bit of a combination, combination of the uh, the food working and it progresses to a different type of, of, of a defensive variation based on on the actions from the attacker you know what we we're talking before you know like the, the tackling in in the air or tackling uh, uh, as we are uh, grounding on, on, on the court uh, some exercises to continue working on the uh, on orientation in, in in control of the uh, the player as a main objective on on the one-on-one -on -one, uh, duel, you know, making sure that no matter what options are available for the attacker, we are always are going to be in control um, of the space, either by controlling the uh, the uh, the attack or by forcing, you know, for example, a um, uh, an offensive uh, attack. Right, right now we're blocking the. Uh, the ball, the defense of the ball, not just from the uh, over arm throw, but you know, on the side, and as you can see, also, um, you know, the control of the uh, of the player without the ball. Sounded like a soccer commentator. Commentator, and and, and, but, and uh, it's very hard to it's very hard to create technical drills for defense in isolation. Right. So much of the techniques that you require in defense require another player. That's why these aren't considered joint because the focus is on individual, not collaborative. In the joint technical drills, they're all collaborative skills. These are individual skills that they're just working collaboratively, collaboratively because you can't do it in isolation. And then we have one more. And what, what I like about this, Craig, if you allow me to interrupt, yeah, it's no. like the parallel process. It's, it continues to be a parallel process. You know, like you're developing the attacking skills at the same time that you're developing the uh, the, uh, the, off the defensive skills and vice versa. You know, it, it's always a, a parallel process of learning um, in terms of what you're developing. And that's something that you need to, all coaches and, and teachers and players need to consider that. Uh, just being able to do a split step simply isn't enough if you can't do it on person. 
if in a game, right. if if I can beat my air body, my big float, uh, uh, my big uh, air air dummy, and if I can I can do a good move on the air body, and I can't do it on a person, the air body did no good for me. So it has to be translatable uh, to the context of 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 the action you want to achieve. Give give me a minute because I believe you would just answer a question that was posted. You know, how do you actually? This is all good, but uh, you know. Uh, wouldn't it be better if it's in a game situation? So you just answered that his question. You know, obviously you start the rudiment in this control environment, but then later on you put it onto uh, into you know game situations or or man. And you have situations. to remember where we're at in the period in the pyramid. Right. We're in we're in a place that's not attached to con in a in the court setting. We're just focused on the actions themselves. But even when we focus on the actions, we can't do it alone. Uh, with the defender. I mean, what are they just going to do? Go like this all the time by themselves? No, it's, it's right. th those visual cues are important. And also the contact cues are important for defensive training. Uh, it's the vibrational load is super important. If you don't let your players have contact and then put them in a game, it, 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 it's, it's a recipe for disaster because they weren't in the proper place. They need a rest cycle and right before the game. But if for like weeks, they haven't had it, it's, it, it can be, it can be difficult. And here we're going to do one last uh, thing before we uh, consider. And these are and these type of defensive ones are ex excellent because they're still visual cueing. They're building. These are because they're younger kids. They're the the video we just saw. Uh, see, they're going to work to it. See, their progression's different. They start with a more child appropriate contact. But now they're going into more sport. But it's it's just a repetition of skills. It's not about it's not about problem solving and it's not about decision making. The only psychological part in it and cognition is uh, visual cues. And rep and, and, and it, go, it goes back, it goes back to what we were talking at the very beginning. You know, like um, of of in, in lecture number one and understanding the game as a player. You know, like the importance of learning how to solve the uh the situations at a, at a at a individual level so eventually they can your skill set can actually translate or transfer to a collective or more team approach to the actions but you know once again i like to use that that word uh, the parallel process of of learning uh you know the skill set from defense and, and and offense and and how they actually translate to to the development of of the um the players yeah, and these videos are about in these exercises. Yeah, and and what what's 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 interesting is they're just repeating actions. They're not making decisions. Yep. They're just repeating actions. They're not. They're using their footwork. Maybe they get beat, but there was no decision in it. They knew the person was trying to beat them. <laughs> so so I think at the very end he brings in. I like this. So this is this is a, a, a attack in zones, so that you can work with the zone next to you. Or uh, and now they went from attack in zones to a, a, a full team, and that's a progression. That's how progression works. See, now the skills they were working on before are br brought in in the end uh, to, to reinforce what they were doing. And you were going to say? And the, the use of the rudiments. No, none of these kids are being coached to use the rudiment, to dissuade, to anticipate, to do the, the pistol movement. You know, they have already, you know, been trained to react to the situations using them. So it's, it's, it becomes a natural you know, uh, a natural part of their game. You know, they're not thinking about doing it. It's already cognitively developed uh, and, uh, and they're just yeah. executing. And and this is an important point. And this for, for I know there's a lot of guys on here that are a part of experienced clubs and they don't know what to do when a new guy walks in. And I'll be honest with you, you treat him wrong. You treat her wrong because you don't know, you don't realize that the the, first level of learning is finding space you put them at the wing until they can develop something because you can't trust them somewhere else and you put them at the outside defender and they never ever learn the game on they never get game 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 understanding because they're never taught it because if they're not brought out of that context and put in a 4v3 plus goalkeeper situation and learn to attack space will they ever be able to do anything for you and that's why so many people leave that's why so many so many people leave established clubs because people don't recognize that you have to 
introduce the preoccupation with attacking space first. And if you come in and all they do is play six v six and they're a bunch of experienced players and you're new, you're 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 not doing them well. And I'm going to talk about this in the modified developmental pathways discussion tomorrow because it's really important. It's really important if we wish to improve it and you want to have young, vibrant players, you got to treat them like young, vibrant players who need to be taught how to play handball. And that's where we're going to right. end this to the, right here with things to consider. Remember, coordination and conditioning exercises are essential tools for technical development and are useful tools in the technical skill development process. Rudiment drills are valuable tools for the middle phases of the development stages of cognitive, associative, and autonomous technical skill development. Remember, coming back, players can, player has control of manipulation, trial and error, and mastery. You can't force them to do it. It's, it's inside of them. And then techniques are variable and sequential, and each pattern and order must be rehearsed and improved to be successfully performed in the game, which we're going to get to in our next lecture, which I'm going to step away from here and allow Julio um, uh, to step in. Yes. So uh, what, what we're going to do now is, is talk a little bit in our break in our breakout room. Um, uh, if, uh, if, well, first of all, are there any questions other than the, the oh, yeah. one that I that you have already answered um, from David, uh, David Aguilar. I, I think we had that one already down. So what we're gonna do is um, I'll, I'll share my screen really quick. Uh, and then um, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, performance anxiety um, and, and management of, uh, of, of the, um, these um, um, individual psychological trait and how it's important in, in the development of a player, especially with new players, you know, uh, manage anxiety, uh, better uh, performance, better development. So if you allow me to um, share my screen for a minute, and what we're gonna do is, um, we'll go through to this presentation, maybe we take like a 10 minutes break, and then we go into the last presentation for the day, and, um, and, and that will be, uh, the way that we're gonna uh, end uh, the symposium. So you just give me one minute. I need to find um, these uh, lecture for one minute. Okay. And if you allow me, we are ready to go. So why performance anxiety? You know, there are several, um, several uh, ideal traits uh, in, in the modern handball player, you know, psychological flexibility. I think all of you, all of us can agree that uh, one of the sports with the highest uh, psychological, um, you know, demands are handball because of how vigorous and, and, and frontal and fast the sport is and how quick everything moves. You can be in the same situation uh, right now and uh, go in an, in an actual transitional game and come back and be in the same situation again, in which in, in each case, you um, were not, um, couldn't have been successful. But I, I um, before we talk a lot about a little bit about it, I, I want to I wanna make this um, presentation a little bit more interactive. Uh, so I, I'm going to ask you um, uh, a performance anxiety self inventory, you know, um, um, question or uh, questionnaire is really, really short. And uh, if, and I, I'll, I'll let you, I'll give you 10 seconds to read each one of the, each one of the, the, the questions that I have. And if you can just list them on the, um, on the chat room. Um, so I can have a better understanding of where we are in terms of this, you know, like uh, number one will be excessively concerned about the outcome of the practice of the game. Number two, um, Pre-game jitters, throwing up, use of the restroom, et cetera, uh, negative thoughts. Number three, bad move before the games. Uh, five will be tense. And um, six will be trouble sleeping before and after the game. So what I want you to do is just like look at this for a minute. And if you can, uh, from one to six, uh, put in your chat room the things that you have experienced, not only as a, as a, um, as a player, as a coach, but even in, 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 in uh, in real in real life uh, situations, okay. So I'll give you like ten seconds to to answer, and then we jump into the next um, slide. And then at the end of the uh, when I stop sharing my screen, we look at the answers, okay.
So there are two mechanisms of, of, of anxiety. One is somatic, which is basically how you feel, you know, what the anxiety, how you make you feel, you know, uh, and, and sweating, you know, eating, uh, um, and all, uh, all the things that can happen physiologically, you know, um, in terms of, of how you deal with anxiety. And then cognitive, which is basically how it affects your, your vision or how it affects your out, the outcome of what you're expecting to the, the action that you're expecting to have. Okay, I don't wanna get into the clinical part of it. For those who don't know, I am a clinician. This is what I do for a living. So I don't wanna get into um, too much into this because it's not relevant to what, I, to what I need you to know, what we want you to know, okay? Uh, identifying anxiety, you know, there are, there are two distinct types of anxieties. One is, you know, the trait anxiety, this, those are the what that you uh, were born with, you know, like everybody has experiences anxiety in a different way, okay? Uh, and I'll tell you one thing, uh, my friends, um, it is okay to feel anxious, you know, the problem is when anxiety overtakes uh, your performance, you be, the, the, the actual state of anxiety is too, um, you know, uh, out of control that in, in, uh, impacts your performance. Remember, low anxiety, high performance. And the other one is the state, is where you are. You know, there are certain players um, that wants to do everything. They want to win the game. They have so much, you know, uh, intensity. They leave the game in such way that those will be the one who will tell you, you know what, give me the ball and I'll, 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 I'll take the seven meters or, or, or those are the one who get the, 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 set, the two minute suspension in the first uh, action of the game because they're, they're so anxious in, in performing that um, automatically uh, the out of control anxiety uh, turns out in, into something negative. So the idea is understand that anxiety is uh, an important part of our performance. What's important is, is how we control it, you know, how we can actually manage the anxiety. Okay, so I have divided the process in three in three uh, steps. You know, uh, we need to reduce the anxiety, uh, the performance anxiety before the game. Okay, there are there are uh, three steps before, which is basically when you recognize that the pregame numbers are normal. That's what I've been saying. I, as a coach, you know, I sometimes feel uh, very nervous. Uh, um, I I have to admit that have my own routine to actually um, deal with that there because, you know, it is important. We, we care about the results. We care about, you know, there's so many complicating factors that you look into when you are uh, uh, coaching uh, that obviously those first three, four minutes or, or the, the warm up is always a, uh, uh, a moment where, where you have the racing thoughts that might lead you to a place where you don't want to be. So this is why I prepare myself mentally and physically. You know, uh, I don't know if anyone have seen you coach, uh, see me coaching, but I have my own routine where I walk through all the lines of the court and it's basically uh, putting myself uh, into the zone. And I do a lot of visualizings. You know, I, I, I have the mental games, you know, like uh, I, I, I start thinking, well, if it does this, I'll do this. You know, I'll visualize a lot of, a lot of uh, the actions that I, that I, and where, where will I actually start doing this? When will I stop? When will I pull the plug and stuff like that? So I, I'm already prepared prepare mentally to deal with those pregame jitters, okay? Uh, I have a short video of Liz Harnett, one of the uh, women's national team um, uh, players who uh, she describes how she deals with the uh, performance anxiety. So if you can see, it's almost like the same same methodology. Everybody has their own uh, a way of dealing with performance anxiety and anxiety Leo, I in think, general. I think we had no volume. Oh, we didn't have volume. No. Try again. Um, it's it's at the maximum in my computer. Can you hear? No. no. You can. I would just relate what she said. Well. What, what she was saying is that she deals with performance anxiety by, by listening to the music that actually puts in the, in the, in the plays. 
and by imagining her win shot and how she actually can visualize, you know, the ball going in the back of the net. So, which is basically uh, similar to what I have said. And and there's no right or wrong on this. Everybody can actually, you know, uh, manage that anxiety. In in some people pray, some people call their family members, some people just are on their own. Uh, some people uh, become extremely effective for the team players, you know, to show, uh, to deal with, um, um, with the process. Okay. So sorry if I'm rushing through it because, you know, I want to be mindful of the uh, the time. Now, this is very important. And this is where, this is where all as, as coaches and as developers and, and, and granted that this is from the perspective of an actual match, but all these can apply to, uh, to a daily training, to a weekly training, to a club training, because of what we, what, what we want is the, uh, the, the uh, sustainability of the, uh, um, you know, of the programs. What we want is uh, retention. We wanna make sure that uh, we are okay at, you know, accepting, you know, that, some of the players might not be at the level what, what they need to be at. And if we already, uh, kind of like Craig had mentioned before, if we already shamed it, they're gonna get to a place where they're not gonna come. So it is important that even at the practices or during the game, if you're playing for the national team, or if you're a referee, uh, or if you're someone who uh, might be affected by this, that you actually understand uh, the importance of reducing performance anxiety, even during the event during the actual, and I like to call it event because it can apply to everything. You know, you need to focus on the task that is at, 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 at um, on, on the task that we're dealing with, okay? Um, sometimes we put the emphasis on the score and the time and all, that's what the coaches are for. As an athlete, your job is to make sure that you can be the best uh, um, person of yourself. One thing that I really, really uh, push is to, the ludic part of the sport, you know, the, what, what brought you to play the sport, be happy about it, having fun. So play like you don't care about the outcome. Coach like you don't care about the outcome. And that's what the biggest problem is, that we, we, we care too much about the outcome uh, and we don't, we don't care about the experience that we are having. You know, I, I think um, one of, the, uh, one of the, uh, the key factors that I use coaching in Spain was actually that. It's like, I am in a world championship. I... This is my second time, and for the first time, I am the coach. So, you know, it was important for me to see that. I have actually bring to, to play with me people that I care, people that I want them to be with me, people that are helping me to be with me. So I put the emphasis on that. Obviously, the results are important. But even, even in terms of the result, I thought about, you know, all I care is about competing. And I think we actually have a very... Uh, um, successful tournament, even though that, you know, the results were not where we wanted to be. I, for, I catch myself forcing a smile and um, I support, I support my teammates. I, I, I support my, my players, you know, I, they made mistakes and very often I, I reprimand them. I, I normally, I lose my, my, my mind or I, I, it turns the problem when they do things that are not scripted or things that we didn't plan. But most of the time, I uh, on the error, I, I become the source of validation and support. Okay, and then after the game, this is very important too, because um, I mean, I, I I just had a recent experience in Costa Rica, and I went to uh, uh, over there, and I heard uh, one of the coaches, you know, um, having a post game uh, talk, and and he asked me also, can I give you some? Can you give me some tips? It's like, well. Your post-game talk was like 45 minutes and your pre-game talk was 10 when it should be the other way around. If you are going to spend some time with the athletes presenting what you want to uh, uh, present to them, it has to be in another setting. You know, you motivate at the very beginning, let it go. And then towards the end, you review the game, okay? Recall the things that you did well, but you have to disregard, you know, everything that went, that went wrong. You know, you, we put too much emphasis at time in the negative things and we don't look at the positive things. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that, that, that it is important to look at the negative things because we still want to win, but it's important to, to empower the strengths and manage the weaknesses, okay? Like I said, I know that we did a lot of things wrong, but then 
you know, uh, this dismiss what, what hinder your, your performance. And then if it's possible, if you are in a consistent environment, you know, design trainings uh, uh, programs that can actually mimic the negative things that affected the performance. Now, we're not gonna talk about performance anxiety. If I, I mean, as a clinician, I have to at least point you in the right direction. I'm never gonna be able to give you the solution to, to your problems. I will guide you to the process uh, because like I said, it's, it's all traits, it's personality traits. It's how you are uh, genetically designed to deal with this. But I can offer you tools to deal with it. And, and I think that um, the self, um, um, the, uh, make, the exercises that we use to, uh, um, to empower or to manage it or to self-prepare for, uh, for this process are important. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, one of the uh, uh, things that we, the meditation, so some of the uh, um, uh, exercises or, or, or things that we actually prescribe so you can actually improve your performance anxiety. And one of those being mindfulness because it helps with, uh, uh, and mindfulness, I don't wanna get into it either because it's, this is not the forum for it. It's a type of meditation that helps to um, uh, con control the emotional uh, uh, regulation. You know, if you are emotionally regulated, remember it's all about regulating, controlling, managing. You decrease the reactivity, um, positive or negative, you know, and you increase the responsive flexibility. Remember what I mentioned to you at the very beginning about how flexible uh, Hamble is, how you can be on a, on a fast break right now, miss the goal, okay? Come back and then go back and score the winning goal. So you have to actually uh, work on um, improving your uh, uh, flexibility, your response, how, how flexible you are uh, in your response. And lastly, as I mentioned before, you know, um, control, manage anxiety, um, it's equal, uh, it will lead to high performance. So I will look now into the responses and with that, I will finish my person, my, the breakout rooms and see what they have. Well, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate what you say because, and I want to attach this to it because um, it's important as coaches and as players to understand where we're at when we're our first step in the development process is learning to attack, not learning to score. And you players get, Oh, I missed the shot, but they had a great one V one duel. And it's really important to frame it. That's what I talked about before this framing as a coach to say, this was my expectation of you. You did great. We'll work on the, the finalization. You can have a goalie having an awesome game and it doesn't matter how great you are. It just is gone. And so that's in handball, especially it's not like, it's not like a field goal kick. That's all on the kicker and maybe a little bit to the defense. It's there's a, there's a many factors involved in that. And so I, I think that's important to, that you pointed that out, especially with anxiety uh, for athletes. Um, yes, definitely. Um, it, it's, it's, it's so important, you know, and, and there are studies out there that, that shows that they even, you know, uh, the high performing athletes, you know, uh, one of the, uh, the, the learned skills um, to enhance the performance um, it, it's, you know, managing it in, the importance of how we do as a coaches, as developers, you know, um, in managing that, you know, and like, hey, buddy, it's okay. You know, you get, it's gonna, it's, you're gonna, even when you're teaching, you're gonna be okay. Because if you, by nature, you're someone who is, uh, is, is nervous, you know, is all over the place. If you start doing something negative, then your mindset is gonna be immediately to that. I cannot do it. And there you go, is one, one player that we just lost. So I think the answers were one to five or six. Some of them were three, four, five. So I, I if you didn't answer anything, um, um, perfect, they you're fantastic. Their they answered in their head. <laughs> yes. So, so we but, need to uh, ask ourselves, do we want to take a five minute break? The last lecture of the day is shorter. I deliberately made that the last one because it's shorter. It's, uh, uh, it's, maybe 15, 20 minutes long. So I think that uh, maybe a five minute break and then come back. Is that, are we, are we good on that?
Melissa, is that I okay? Think, or... I think that's fair. That's fair. Okay, so let's take a five minute break. We'll come back at, uh, uh, let's take a seven minute break at 15 after and I'll make sure the last, uh, and it's, but it's important, don't miss it on your way back because it, it ties in everything for the day and sets up tomorrow well. So thank you everyone. That's great. Right, thank you. See you at 15 after.
All right, we're back on. Mr. Roth, when you're you ready. Sorry, everyone, 4.15. Uh, I'm glad everyone had, has stuck with us. We're getting to the good stuff, which sets us up for tomorrow. Um, very important uh, to then apply it tomorrow to the team and, and coaching context. Um, this, this look at how players are developed. Uh, so we're going to begin by uh, finishing where we started today, what we set out to do with small group exercises for technical development. Now, this is uh, exercises that that players can perform many functions, and it's very important to locate these drills and exercises within the pyramid. And so that's where I'm going to begin. Um, what we've sorry, what we've covered so far. Uh, what we've covered so far is rudiment, technical and uh, physical and psychological. We're now going to move uh, to cover game problems, tactical drills and joint technical drills, but we're not really going to address game problems here. We're just going to mention the fact that when you begin work on tactical drills, you implement uh, uh, work on game problems. And so uh, if you, it, we can have a deeper discussion in a breakout room tomorrow, but uh, for right now, just know that that's uh, what we're covering right now. Um, small group exercises for technical development have two categories, um, multiplayer or joint technical drills, which develop individual and joint technical skills in isolated technical context, focus on execution. These are like passing and catching. You can't, it's hard to learn to pass if you're alone throwing to a wall. And then there's tactical drills, which develop individual and joint technical skills in isolated tactical context. So we're going from the isolated technical context to the isolated tactical context. It focuses on problem solving, decision making, and execution, not just execution like in the other. When we pull apart uh, the training pyramid and look at the tactical technical training. Now we're at the top of the technical training pyramid. We're looking at uh, joint technical drills. Remember, for synergy to happen, this needs to be in place. So this is how I work with and collaborate with my, uh, technically speaking, with my teammates. This isn't about problem solving. It's simply about how we cross together, how we uh, pass and catch together. What's our angles? What's our approach? This is when we talk about preferences. This is where you learn what your teammates do and don't do or like to do and don't like to do in given situations. This is really where you take away a ton of data uh, for you for the context side, but it's only in repetition, repetition, repetition. Remember, if I say technical, it means repetition. If I say tactical, it means problem solving. So uh, we look at uh, joint technical drills. Uh, they develop more complex techniques of tactical movement patterns into basic movement skills. We could deep dive that and we will uh, for certification because you need to understand these, but the concepts aren't necessary now. Just understand we're taking uh, two uh, isolated uh, people and Man, uh, doing maneuvers and doing technical skills and how they interrelate. It's work on passing and catching movement, timing, progressive exercises. And I could do a, I could do a three, I could do a module on progressive exercises. Isolated technical context, which means it, you specifically identify it and you uh, 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 explain to your players or as a player, it's explained to you what you're exactly doing. It's a series of combined technical actions, increased complexity, You'll see this in the videos, low cognitive demand, low decision making. It doesn't mean there's none, but it just means low and it involves other players. Best in early and intermediate stages of technical skill development and best in the third and last of the micro phases. Like in the first one, you've been presented, you've been uh, uh, manipulated and then you, uh, you then try to replicate it. In the, in the other one, it's practice and ends with refinement. At the practice and refinement stages, this is an important uh, aspect. Um, the methodology for joint technical drills in development of attack and defense. I cut a slide uh, from something earlier. Is practice technical skills in space with obstacles, passive and active defenders for visual cue. I'll say this again, visual cue is important. If necessary, maintain isolated game context for continuity. Focus on teaching uh, or focus on technical sequencing with progressive exercises that focus on variability and sequencing. Use supporting players and actions for context building. Here we're just building the context. 
we're taking a piston pass in from a left back and at center back i'm doing a split step on a dummy that i'm then shooting on uh with a jump shot you know we're just context building that's all we're doing we're, we're pre-scripting it we increase speed and repetition only with quality uh and we're create individual tactical context or joint technical actions for drills these can be position and or phase related. And this is important. Uh, working with lines of three players going down, working on first, passing in transition, crossing in transition, empty crosses. These are all important parts of it. And I'll let uh, 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 the key areas of focus, I'll let Julio discuss these. Sorry, is the uh, automatically you go into muting so there's no uh, complicating uh, noise. Uh, what's important to understand, and 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 I I want to make this pause right here before I jump into this, uh, is that you as an athlete and and you have to also have an, somehow an understanding of everything that we're saying so you can demand you know. Uh, it program or your coaches or 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 you actually self become self-aware of where you are in terms of your development so you can see a positive progression. So um I want to I wanted to make that and I and, and I know that Craig you probably will agree to what I'm gonna say. It, it is important that that you and as an, as an athlete also understand um where you are in in the pyramid of development. Okay. So I wanted to make that interjection there, so so you can actually um, get get a better sense of of what we're saying as well and, and what we are recommending. Because at the end of the day, all this is 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 recommendation from someone who's actually writing the curriculum at, at the global level. So it is important that um, that we look into this uh, because it's, it's it's factual information or at least information that has. Um, a lot of su supportive um, uh, ideas behind it. So the, the development of the attack, you, you, the, the areas of focus have to be in designing, you know, exercises with individual technical action that can be exaggerated, altered or altered, okay? For the sake of emph emphasizing something, okay? You wanna make sure that, that you, you develop you develop something that is actually um, important in what you're emphasizing during that practice. You know, little by little, it's like, it's all about, remember when we were talking about rudiments and, 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 and how those rudiments can progress into something more complicated. You need to start adding or, re, or re, requiring uh, to, to little by little start getting uh, uh, other dimensions that can make uh, you're a better player, you can actually build your skills. Uh, we also have to control uh, the variability of us and the sequencing of what we're trying to develop, okay? Uh, specifically, if we wanna go from something that is you know, less complex to something that is can actually evolve to join complex and, and, and more te difficult technical actions. Uh, and also the goal of the multiplayer technical drills has to be su a successful uh, execution of all the technical actions. You know, we need to make sure that when we start connecting, interconnecting all these, all these, uh, all these skills, that those actions actually have success. Okay, not just do it because we want to, because we want to do it. And quite often, that's something that that we see a lot. It's like you know, we go to a practice is because this is a, a, a drill that we learn when we pro play professional. We want to do it with with different um, um, athletes. That are in different levels and simply it's not gonna work. And it could be in a core context or separate from it. Something that you can do it if you have access to it, or you can actually create an individual context or 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 a different context to to execute it. And here's some samples uh, for an attack. You can see there's coordinated actions. They're doing somersaults, sit down, stand ups. They're still performing. They're not decision making. The defense is joint in this, which I like. Um, 
uh, you're doing uh, cartwheels, you're doing, so you're doing coordinated exercises and then you're entering the, the, the situation, the defense has it. You're not decision-making. You're just, you're just trying to get the breakthrough. And so look more coordinated exercises. It's just replication of it. And this helps with, with understanding uh, the, uh, each of the ligaments of the game. Um, one of the things that I uh, especially like about uh, the the next video, which I'm going to show you, is the uh, complicate or the complex uh, practice construction. If you look at this, they got a rudiment drill on the bench, which, by the way, never replicate. I asked my insurance, I you if you have an injury in the United States and you're using something that's not for its its purpose, you will actually have to uh, pay the medical bills and not your insurance because the a uh, lot of the Europeans love the to use the benches, but you can't use the benches in that fashion in the United States. So just a word of warning, don't don't <laughs> don't make it up. But you can see here they're they're using different parts of the court for different things. They're using the air body in the middle for visual cue. They're not decision making. They're just learning how to do it. The defense is barely even there. I call that as a coach, I call that passive defense. You know, you're just there to kind of be an obstacle that's moving. You're not there to actually win the fight. Here it is again. Controlling just, the space. Yeah, you're just and 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 as a as a coach, we just need to be able to do that. And I'll do one last one for an attack. And you can see still using the devices. They got a Hummel jersey on a on a box. They have a box on its side to replicate. Use what you can. Using look at this, they're doing passing to the pivot between the backcourt. There is a defender out there. They're not really doing anything. It's just repeated actions, but these are joint actions. These are the joint actions in the game. So if you notice, we've now combined singular actions in the game context, but we're still training them like a technique, but it's a joint technique. You know, you can't pass, you can't catch a ball as a pivot if the ball's never thrown to you and you need to learn to train together like this. And so it's linking in. Now they've linked in a backcourt with the center back to pivot. Look, they're working on the same things now against a defender for the breakthrough. This is where you can get creative as a coach. I, these progressive, I love these progressive exercises. I have, I have created so many, I have the kids that are outside and not, not no longer uh, in the drill have to do something. They don't just stand there. Like I see kids standing and sitting in the corner, but my kids, you have some coordinated tasks. You can add tasks. You can add run to the other side and back, make them tired, but then they still have to perform it. That's very game-like. And so it's important to understand. Um, we're going to now talk about, uh, I'll let Julio talk about joint technical drills for defense. It is actually, Craig, uh, very, very important what you just said. It, it is the, uh, um, how, how you can basically connect those actions, you know, in, into leading into uh, more complicated situations during the game. Um, that will that will actually develop the uh, the mental dimensions that we're looking into the in the players. You know, um, is, is that repetition without a position that sometimes becomes boring and we reject during during the games and we go immediately into um, uh, game situations that. Then when we try to execute it with all the complicating factors of the game, they don't work well. And this is what, what it's, it's that phrase of, well, you do it well in practice, but you don't do it in the game and vice versa. Uh, we need to find that, that parallel um, process. Well, in defense, it's almost like the same thing. You know, like the, the key areas are, are the observation, you know, and part of it is just because, like I said before, we want to make sure that we develop the right set of skills. And, and once we develop the, the right set of skills that we actually executed well, okay? So we need to actually create exercises. Uh, I've been talking this through the entire, to the entire day, where there's actually parallel process where there's going to be individual, okay, uh, development, but at the same time, individual de development of, you know, join, uh, um, defense. One of the things that I'm going to be talking tomorrow in my presentation, once we start talking about uh, uh, defense at a more from the perspective of a coach, is the importance of that collaboration between, you know, the, the 2v2, the two versus two collaboration, so you can actually improve that, um, you know, uh, the defensive skill. Also, man maintaining the control over the choices, you know, what, what is it that you're going to do? You know, 
making sure that if you go for it, you go for it, you take control of it. And if, if you don't have control of it, you adapt to the next step, to whatever the, the following action or the sequence of the game is, okay? And then create the complexity and the intensity as you progress. You know, we always say that we want to, uh, and using, uh, 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 you know, on, uh, a musician's uh, analogy, we're gonna go from a slow tempo uh, to a faster tempo. So we're gonna go from a low pace, uh, memorization, you know, controlling, um, you know, that is space that Craig was talking about, where you want to make sure that is the actual player who makes a decision, it is in control of everything, so they can learn, to then speed training, so you can actually uh, mimic what is uh, a game situation would look like. And everyone's lucky, because when I reformatted the slides, one of them didn't come with. So in this, in this uh, video, what you would have seen was the inverse, where the almost identical to the attack, it was structured for defense in joint uh, drills, where similar to like when we saw the defensive technical drills, where the offensive people were like robots, not really trying. It's the same for that, and that's what was important. And so we're going to move now to right. The, so the, what changes is the, uh, the what changes is the emphasis we were talking yeah, the about emphasis. Our, our, earlier. Before. And with joint technical drills, it's not very. It doesn't take a a very smart person to figure out. Oh, I just flip this, and now it's the defense working on their triangle or the defense working on dissuasion coming out you know even if it's laborious passing between the left back and the center back coming out even though they're doing passing to the pivot this time it's the defense focused on the two-step pattern and shielding and so it's just it's just the two things are are interchangeable because remember when we get to the second level we're in that small group level this is our first time here we're looking around now. Now we're seeing gameplay is being built. Synergy is about to be built and gameplay is about to be built. And it's hugely important. And so now we have, we come into, uh, uh, sorry, we move from joint technical drills all the way over to tactical drills. It's our first time taking tactics into, and these are the last of our slides, just a few more slides to go. Now we're looking at problem solving in relationship to tactical drills. And we almost have, someone asked me before, they're almost similar drills, but with problem solving now that you ran with the technical, now you run it with almost like a game-like thing. And so it's developed the techniques required of tactical movement patterns, crossing with and without the ball, passing to the pivot, passing to the wing. But this time it's with the repetition of a single game movement with integrated technical and, motive, uh, and movement actions, isolated tactical context, which means you almost freeze it. You almost freeze it. You can almost say, you know, it's, it's the pivot and uh, it's this pivot it's a backcourt player and it's a air body and you're going to try to defend it coming from the uh, inside defender position whatever you want to do offensively or defensively but it's always in this context of the game it's always in the context of the game which means they have to be replicated in the court they have to be replicated in the court where they would happen on the court that's key that's really key for tactical drills and developing tactical skills is that it has to be replicated because all of that sense data goes into a player's uh, um, uh, memory and his history and his experience or her history and experience. And that is, is then later on the down the road, uh, you, it, it, it's, they, they have access to it without even knowing they have access to it. And it accumulates, you know? And so what I really wanna talk about then is this idea of the methodology. You first practice pattern movements and actions in isolation. Don't do it with a, with a drill yet or with a, a defense, but you, you, they know it's coming. It's just, you're just uh, 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 presenting it to them. Then you use obstacles, passive active defenders for visual cueing and game-like conditions. You develop complexity and variability with progressive skills. This is really where uh, problem solving, decision making, and and uh, uh, unique playing style comes together. This is where the the way I do a uh, I have a certain way I love to do a pass to the pivot. I even will call it. I'll tell the guy I'm going between your legs, and I'll try it. I'll still try it. I'll just try to get it in there. I'll just try to snap that in there. And then you can see it's like a game. It's where that you kind of get that style that's your own, and it's important to develop that in your players. And it's important to develop that as a player. You're not a, a, a cookie cutter player. That's the beauty of handball is that there's this, this bending to uh, personality and style 
uh, versus just being I run straight. You know, if you're if you're a a uh, a person who's in a performance like track and field, it doesn't matter what your personality is. You either run fast or you don't. But here, your your actions are reflective of your personality and your style and your persona, whatever you bring to it. And it's important that here within tactical drills, within problem solving and decision making, that players develop those kind of things. You focus on quality again before speed, but work to game like conditions. You add sequencing tasks and skills as choices and not predetermined. Here, you can work in all sorts of conditioning and coordination. Also, it doesn't, and then because the, like I said before, the legs go, the mind goes, it's important to do that. Have them do, have them do a, uh, a plank or have them do a 20 sit-ups, have them do uh, 15 somersaults and then come back and try to see if they can do a pivot shot. You know, these type of things are like developing them and always focus on decision making and finalization and not result. This is the key. Tactical drills are the lowest end of the pyramid. It is not unless the unless finalization, the tactical games, finalization, result. This is a drill. This is a drill. Finally, it's it's your your first step is to get them to the goal. The second step is to score it. You know, so so you can't you can't. You can't skip that out. You can't be like, or you can't um, hold them accountable for something that, I mean, it's tough. It's complex. You break through. And the first time you break through, you're like, holy crap, I'm free. <laughs> and then you watch kids do it and they shank the, the shot because they didn't know what to do because it was the first time they put together this action with people trying to stop them. And then all of a sudden they're in and that's the next phase. And then you have to develop that. But it's important to understand. And here I'm going to show you, and I like the context with kids because here you can see the defense is passive. Look, so the defense isn't really, really playing yet. You're learning the tactical concept. You can see this in space. You can see this situation in a game. Well, sorry, let me unvolume. You can see this situation in a game. Look, they even use tools to then there, an outside defender covering it passed to the wing. Stuff I talked about earlier. There, pass to the wing from the backcourt with a bounce pass. Talked about it earlier, showed video on it of, uh, you know, doing it. There we go. Sidestep to the uh, sidestep in, pass to wing. Here we go. Wing pass to backcourt. You know, so you're starting to see the shape of the game come out. And look, you got a pivot holding someone back. Here we go. Now we got to, is he going to shoot? Is he going to pass? You're starting to make decisions. You're starting to recognize where they're vulnerable. Here we got multiple people going at once. We're doing a technical skill drill followed by a tactical drill. You could add a coordinated into that. You can add a conditioning into that. I like this view because you see it. It looks like the game. It's a game situation. Those are important. And on defense, it's important. And it could it could be guided too, you know, like you you give it, you you give them task, and then maybe every three or four you let them do uh uh, uh, whatever they want to do based on, on, on their task. But uh, like we were talking earlier, now the emphasis has changed to, to defense and how, you know, the exercises are, are designed to, um, you know, empower the, the defensive actions, you know, and, um, and develop those uh, skills um, that were, um, that we were talking before. Um, once again, it's, it's all about giving the task, repetition, um, and, and, and making, creating objective as well. You know, uh, it, it's important what Craig says, you know, like you divide the drill in two. So today what I want to shift is this. And then you start progressively adding, you know, uh, more stuff to, to what you're trying to do, and especially uh, at this age, you know, where things have to be uh, a little bit more guided. When they start growing up and they start uh, be becoming um, uh, multidimensional, then the decision-making process becomes more, more important. You know, where, where are they going to go uh, in terms of finding the solution or resolution to the problems that they're in? But, um, you know, these are really good, really good, um, you know, exercises. And what I like is they're not only combining the technical and tactical, but they're also helping a lot in the... Uh, um, humble specific uh, physical fitness. Yes. You know, which, you know, uh, be especially in, in our in our uh, programs, you know, some of the times we don't have three, four, five days of the week so we can work on, on each one of them. 
So uh, the fact that they're creating uh, an environment that tackles all that is fantastic as well. And, and the reason I like the foam is the visual cue again. Look, it's gaps. There's defenders defending gaps. They don't need to defend behind it because they know it's protected. So they're, they're defending gaps. And so I, you have to be creative in your, your tactical drills, but you can also be, look, technical drill followed by a tactical drill combined right. fantastic it, it said hey we're going to work on neutralizing in the air and then we're going to be here we go we're still working on offensive skills look there, there's a game being played he's trying to use fake right. moves and cutting moves and goal for goal moves to get into it look good hey, hey, how did, counter thrust how skills, that i talked about earlier how does a skill set also trans trans will eventually uh we will be used in the actual uh, game situation you know when you start acting talking about more specific tactic, tactical ideas and zonal defenses and all that, you're already training the, uh, the, uh, the player to understand roles and, and, and boundaries, you know, it could potentially turn, turn out into that, you know, like these are your boundaries, you can only defend here, the, the next boundary belongs to, to your teammate, yeah, I, you can see it in, in this exercise. Yeah. But the, the, the final note I'll make on it, what's important is, it's not, I hear this from people all the time, well, just give me drills. If you don't know when, what drills to do and when to do the drills, it means nothing to have them in your possession. This was, to, I tried to show you a structure, a structure in which you could place a concept. It can be adaptable. I know coaches who are like, the, the, the Yugoslav school loves the rudimentary and technical stuff. They love that stuff. There's, there's, there's a big school for it. There's that, the French school, the French school is all game-based. Uh, creativity training, uh, uh, freedom, uh, uh, open play. Uh, you know, the, 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 the French school is completely different. And so there's, there's so many ways we can do this and you don't have to agree with me, but you can't disagree about the process. You can't disagree about the process that it happens. And, and right. we, we wanna take the next step on this to help you, everyone see that it's not just good enough to have a drill. You need to know when to use it in development, where it links into the causal chain. You know, because this is for me, for me, this is right here is the state. This is refinement. These guys are old enough to do the video. They're in the refinement phase. They're about to go to that higher plateau. They're, they're at a really high level of skill base, but they're still working on base things to create it. And so it's important for, for them in this stage to be free. This is, again goes to that that they're in that they're literally probably in trial and error and, and uh, uh, refinement going into it, and so they're they're really sorting it out. And it's important as a coach to let them go, to do it. Which brings us to the last. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no go no, ahead. Finish. No, no, no. Go ahead. And, and also find finding the correlation between what you're trying to achieve and what the drill uh, uh, brings to the table. You know, like sometimes you go to this practice. It, it happens to me. Um, recently, I went to a practice and I well, show me what, what, we, what we're going to work on today. And oh, we're going to be working on counterattack. But everything that they were doing had nothing to do with, with yeah. what the intention of the practice was. It's like, well, what is the correlation of this and, 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 and this? Well, nothing. So, you know, it's almost like you have to find a purpose of what you're trying to achieve yeah. or what you're trying to teach, you know? I, I agree. And that brings us to this point, the final point of, the, of this lecture is that you begin with simple, uh, that utilize foundational skills. Remember, we talked about it. Foundational is the base and progress to more complex individual and joint technical actions. Remember the cross, the, the cross. You don't see, everybody does the backhand or wrist in the cross, but no one does the shield pass, but shield pass is the first one you do. You see it sometimes at the high level when the center back crosses with the pivot, but you turn your back to the defense and you do an underhand pass as they cross because you can build a feint into it where you hold on and they go past. You focus on developing position specific skills simultaneously with joint technical drills. Tactical drills must always be in the context of the game and in the location where the technical skills and tactical movements will be performed in the game. Problem solving and decision making is vital to tactical drills. You know, and then it, it ends with this for us. The plan for tomorrow is to start on gameplay. The plan for tomorrow is to start with, we're, we're talking about coaches. The, 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 the coaches begin at gameplay. They walk onto the court, they see what they have, and you're at gameplay. You know in your heart, the more you coach, the more you know. You can walk into a room and see another team, just even, even walking in, you know. 
Julio and I watching Serbia walk in with their their culture and their rituals of, of their dancing with their music be right before the game. They've done this a hundred times, you know, in cadet and youth and now at the junior world championships, this is how they enter a building. Well, you can you understand that they're, if if they're that structured in arrival, their gameplay is going to be very structured. And so we begin with the coach and we begin at the top of the pyramid and then look our way down tomorrow. Trickle down. And so, so that's the plan to focus on gameplay and the goal for tomorrow is to complete the pyramid. We have three more tasks to go. We've got small sided games, tactical games and game forms, which are partial game forms, basic game forms, which are tied to game problems. And then it's a standard game form. This is how you develop players and teams. And this is what we're gonna finish with tomorrow. So we really appreciate everyone taking the time. Uh, you, how many are with us still? 18 made it to the end. We hovered around 25 to 35 most of the day. Good job, everybody who made it to the end. Uh, really appreciate your commitment to this. We look forward to meeting you tomorrow. Um, I, uh, I guess, do you have any questions? I think everyone's toast and it's the time of day to be done. Um, there yes, we got a question. Very late. Well done. Do oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the best question of all. We really appreciate and and we really appreciate you putting in this time. What we said in the right. beginning is we want to empower you to develop yourselves and to develop your players. You can't do it. You can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. I didn't learn all this alone. It's not like I walked into a room and saw a book and was like, yes, I know. So many people contributed to my development that I wish to contribute to yours. And that's really where right. I stand. So I feel the same. I feel that I, I am a product of coaching education, of learning from the best, learning from everybody. You know, um, uh, I'm going to use a, a, a word that I, that I probably have, have a different connotation, stealing idea from people, you know, um, developing an eclectic uh, idea where you want to be as a coach or as an athlete, you know, like do you really want to be technical or do I really want to, you know, explore my, my you know, personal traits and, and how I envision sports. So uh, I, I do also want to stand, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what Craig is saying, I, I think is a very, um, the very first step to a journey of thousands of steps that we're all taking together today. So um, I'm really glad for the opportunity and proud to work with, you know, Craig, who's a fantastic uh, methodologist and, and, and a writer. And so um, thank you all for being here. And thank you, Julio. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Right. We'll see, see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.